Hello ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the latest in our straight shooting series. As you can see, we are joined by the one and only One Man Gang. That's right, the One Man Gang's in the house! <laughs> the date is September 4th, 2004. And we'll start off, gang, why did you want to be a wrestler? Why did I want to be a wrestler? The One Man Gang wanted to be a wrestler because I love wrestling. When I was a youngster growing up, just like the majority of the people, I was a mark. I'm not going to talk to these people like they're stupid. I, they know what I'm talking about. I was a mark. I had all the wrestling magazines. I watched all the TV shows. We didn't have VHS at the time, so I would take a little recorder. I would record the interviews, and I would learn them. I'd play them back. I'd stand in front of a mirror and cut my own interviews. This is when I'm like 13 years old before I ever got into the professional wrestling business. I'm cutting my own interviews. I would get paper. I'd make up my own little cards. I'd have finishes and everything else. I didn't even know what a finish was. I just, I knew what happened. But anyway, I was just the biggest mark in the world, and I went to see a live event finally. I saw my first live event in my little town where I grew up. I was originally from Chicago, Illinois, just like all the advertisements say, Halstead Street, Chicago, Illinois. That's where I'm originally from. I lived there for a short time, then I moved to South Carolina, Spartanburg, South Carolina is my hometown. I'm not ashamed of it, yeah, I was raised out in the country, there's nothing wrong with it. So anyway, uh, what was I talking Oh yeah, how I got into professional wrestling. I was a big mark, I watched it all. I mean, I was in Mid-Atlantic, it was Mid-Atlantic Championship Wrestling in the Carolinas, through North Carolina, South Carolina, all that whole section, that East Coast section. So. Uh, uh, some local guys was wrestling, and they had like a little independent group. So I went and saw my first live match, and I knew right then. When I saw the people, the blood, and how the people reacted to them people, the, the match was Rip Hawk and Sweet Hansen. They wrestled the Fighting Kentuckians. One of them's Grizzly Smith, who later I worked with in Mid-South. He was the booker, promoter, whatever you want to call him. But anyway, he was one half of the Fighting Kentuckians, Rip Hawk and Sweet Hansen. And I watched that match, and I said, man, I'm going to do that for a living. Someday I'm going to do that. And right then, I don't know if you know how you, you want to be an artist, you want to be a fireman, whatever. You know that's what you want to be. Right then, I knew that's what I wanted to be was a professional wrestler. And here I was in little bitty Spartanburg, South Carolina, and I wanted to be up there with big-name wrestling stars. You know, it probably was the odds of that happening, a million to one maybe. But anyway, years went by, and slowly I, I kept watching and watching, and finally... Some uh, local guys, they had a little independent group going on. I didn't know nothing, nothing about, you know, taking bumps or doing anything in the business. I had no idea what was going on. But anyway, they said, hey, get up in the ring here. You know, they had this little workout area, you know, where they sit up a ring and they kind of train and do whatever. So I, I went to their little area. I got in the ring and basically it just got thrashed about like some idiot. They just threw me about like a punching bag. Next day I get up, I'm all bruised. My elbows are like black and blue. I got marks all over my body from being beat on, but that didn't stop me. I went back again and went back again and went back. I didn't give up because, you know, I wanted to be a wrestler and I knew this is how I had to do it. So anyway, finally they gave me, you know, a match in the ring. I get in front of, the, I was in some little gymnasium, maybe 10 people in the crowd, but I mean, this is what I want to do for my life, you know, and I went out there and I did the best I could do and basically from there it was step by step progression, slow progression. But I mean, my first five years. I started at the age of 16 till I was 20, till I made it to Mid-South when I was in my 20s. I made no money. It was, it, well, I wasn't making a living at it. I was just doing it to wrestle because I, I love wrestling. That's what I was doing it for. You'd make a show, drive 200, 300 miles and maybe make five dollars. Maybe make five dollars if he's lucky. You know, you're like, that's big time money. I get to buy me a soda pop. That's big time money. But, they, but you know, it's not like it is nowadays. But Back then, that's how I got started. Everybody has a different story of how they got started. That's how I actually got into wrestling business. Who, who actually did the training? I had some uh, local, couple local guys there that were, like I say, it was just independent. They had no name. You wouldn't know them if I if I mentioned the name. Nobody would know them because it's just local, local guys on the circuit down there. And basically, they just brought me into the business. And I guess they just. I had the size already. I knew I had size, and they just taught me the basics of, you know, th how things went. The first time they told me, you know, ba really, <laughs> there's no use hiding it. Everybody knows we do blade jobs. You know, everybody knows that. The first time they told me about that, I was like, you got to be kidding me. 
You know, all the, I mean, I, I go to the matches, I'm like, man, it's blood capsules. Just like everybody does, it's blood capsules or something, you know. And when they told me how it really, you know, how you really do it, I was in shock. I couldn't believe it. But as years went on, I came, became one, probably one of the best ones in the business at doing it, you know. You just, uh, I was alive, so, anyway. What was it like breaking in at such a young age, 16 years old? Uh, did anyone give you a hard time about it? Well, I mean, I went to, you know, I was in school on weekends. I'd go out and do little independent shows. And, uh, my, you know, nobody believed I'd ever make it. My yearbook, you know, of course, everybody everybody knew that I was a wrestling freak. I'd have, you know, I had my T-shirts. And then you couldn't get the real fancy shirts like nowadays. Then you take them to the local print shop and have letters put on them, you know. Like I had a Johnny Valentine shirt, had a Ric Flair shirt had a Bulldog Brower shirt, you know, and when they come to the local, I, I, you know, I'm their fan and all that, which nobody liked them guys except me and a couple of people at school. So my yearbook, you know, people, even now, you go, I go back and read it, and they're like, hey, one day we're going to see you on TV, you'll be a world champion, blah, blah. That's what they were signing, you know, we wrestling. Everything in my yearbook was something to do with professional wrestling, and and like I say, I, through some miracle or whatever happened, that's, luckily I was able to live my dream. Now, uh, you hooked up with Angelo Papo's ICW. How did you get involved with that? Well, the Angelo Papo ICW, uh, after all them years, uh, let me back up one second. Before okay. I made it to Angelo Papo, I was like 19 years old. I'd been on a little independent circuit. We'd go to Georgia, to Carolinas, whatever, and I don't have any idea how they got my phone number, but a promoter from Atlanta, Georgia called and wanted me to do a show in the Omni. They wanted me to come down and, and work a show in the Omni, and I'm like, man, this is like real. This is NWA, real NWA wrestling. So, you know, I didn't even have, you know, I didn't have no transportation. One of my friends, we drove to Atlanta. I went in there. They put a mask on me as some blue angel, and I ended up working Bruiser Brody. Oh, really? Now, who, would, who would think? I'm working Bruiser Brody years later, you know. But uh, the outcome was quite different this time. This time the match lasted maybe three minutes. And he just beat the fool out of me, you know. But that was my first real, you know, with a real crowd, you know, the, and the Omni and all that. It was like, then I got the paycheck, you know, had NWA and all, and all that. I'm like, I was like amazed, you know. I got like a 150 bucks or something just get the crap beat out of me. I'm like, wow, this is like great. <laughs> but then, uh, then from there, getting back to Angelo Papo, ICW, a little group. Uh, some lo some guys there were going back and forth. They go to Kentucky to do their TVs for them. They go up there and do the TV at, uh, where they did the TV in Lexington, Kentucky. So one time they said, well, "Why don't you just go with us?" I wasn't booked on the card. They didn't know me from anybody. So I just traveled with them. You know, I rode with them. And when I got there, you know, I brought my gear with me. You always bring your gear. That's what, you know, anybody out there be a wrestler, I always bring your gear. So I got there, and of course they needed an extra man, like always most places you know doing TVs need somebody extra so I got to go in the ring I, I worked a TV match and as soon as I came out they said man can you you know they right away they, you know they came to me and wanted to know if I could work full time can you you know leave and come up here and live and work for us and all that I'm like man y'all gotta you know I'm like I was a young kid I'm like wait wait a second here you know I gotta go home and ask my mom <laughs> that's true though <laughs> so you know I ended up I went back home I tried to explain it all my mom I'm 19 you know just out of high school and I'm like well you know I can't make it here I, if I want to make myself I'm going to have to leave and go out you know I finally convinced her so <clears throat> and then finally uh, I, I left on my own and went back to ICW up there and my first time back in there was a TV and they wanted me to they wanted me to do the over-the-shoulder backbreaker where you pick the guy up and you put him over your shoulder this way with that backbreaker. Now he gave me some guy that he said, well, let's practice it in the back before we actually go in, you know, do it in front of the cameras. And this guy was like 200 pounds. And, uh, so I went, I picked him up, and his weight shifted too far to the rear and ripped my knee out. Uh, Didn't even get on TV. I ripped my knee out. So I, I went out and done a little TV match, you know, staggered around a little bit or whatever. My knee swole up. It was all messed up. So they... Here, here's my first time, you know, supposedly the organization. I'm crippled already, so I end up having to go back to, you know, go back home and rehab my knee and whatever for a couple of months. And finally, I may get back there, and then that's where the progression started is Crusher Broomfield. Okay. How did your mom react to the knee injury? Because uh, obviously she let you go do this, and then you yeah, come she, back with the <laughs> She wasn't happy at all. <laughs> I told you that's what would happen. <laughs> 
Was so, it any kind of a major setback or just something you had to get through? Just just uh, go home until it healed up and then went back. Mm-hmm. Of course, I never did the over-the-shoulder backbreaker again. Yeah. Then I switched to the splash. <laughs> was there any concern working ICW because they were like an outlaw promotion as they were known back in the day? Uh, I didn't even really know what, you know, at that particular time when I was working, I, it didn't even cross my mind, you know, people say outlaw promotion. I was just having fun. Yeah. You know, we, I wasn't making a living, man. We was riding in these towns and we'd be in a ring truck riding to a town, you know, freezing cold in the back of a ring truck laid up on the ring, you know, on two by fours and whatever. And that's, that's how we'd get to the shows. You know, my first couple of months in there, I lived with, with uh, Randy Savage. I lived at his house, you know, and, uh, I, you know, Randy Savage, uh, pretty much the way you see him on TV, that's the way Randy Savage is. You know, he was pretty crazy, especially at that time. They had this big running feud with Jerry Lawler and the Memphis group. That was a shoot feud, right? That was a shoot feud. Yeah. They was always, I mean, they were spending their TV times challenging them to baby bottle matches and, you know, loser leave towns, and they would, you know, where they were going to be at the Lexington Civic Center, they'd go down and be at ringside and challenge them, you know, and just crazy things like that, which I never got involved in. I didn't see any, even at that young age, I was smart enough to know, man, why waste your TV time doing that? You got your own TV show, worry about, you know, what you're doing. Don't worry about that group. But anyway, uh, and in uh, ICW, people, uh, you know, maybe people hadn't seen it, but we had, a lot of good talent in ICW. We had Ronnie Garvin was there, had a Bob Roop, Bob Orton Jr. was there, had Pistol Pez Wadley, you know. So I mean, they had a lot of a lot of good talent. Had Macho Man, Leaping Lanny, and the, uh, the Miser who was Angelo Poffo. Yeah. Angelo Poffo, of course, Randy Savage's father. What, what exactly. was he like? He was uh, pretty much just like his gimmick was a miser. I mean, he's <laughs> he's pretty tight, you know, with Dollar and all that. I mean, he didn't showcase himself. I mean, we all knew he kind of owned the. You know, he, he owned the thing, but he didn't, he put his little mask on and done his little, you know, second or third match. But, he, I mean, overall, he was a nice guy, I mean, but he was just, he was tight with the money. Any stories about living with Randy Savage? Uh, I don't really, and I, I don't really have no stories like that living with him. I mean, yeah. to me, I guess because I was new, they kind of, you know, they was kind of taking care of me a little bit. They really, it really didn't too much happen while I was around with him. Okay. Who came up with the name Crusher Broomfield? Crusher Broomfield. Well, when I first went up there, you know, before that, I'd wrestled at every, you know, on the independent circuit in the Carolinas. Is everything, you know, Big George, George the Giant. They put a mask on me if they needed a mask. Well, whatever was available, I'd wrestle as. So finally, when I went to ICW, they come up with this idea. Well, we're gonna make you, you know, you're gonna be with Macho Man, Randy Savage, Bob Orton Jr., and you know, and them guys, but you're gonna be kind of subservient. I was like a servant almost to him, you know. They'd slap me around and cuss me. We did a little angle where I had to kiss Randy's boots, stuff like that. And people didn't, you know, people watching is going, well, you know, you're trying to get the audience going, you know, why is he doing all this? So it came out, they just came up with the name Crusher Broomfield. You know, I was a country boy from South Carolina. And uh, it came out as the angle being that my sister was in the hospital and Macho Man had me under control supposedly by paying her hospital bills but as I didn't know the money wasn't wasn't going there she, the money wasn't there she died my sister dies in the hospital so uh, we, we do this little angle this is like a year span you know over and over you know and it builds up as you go along you know you have to watch it to understand it then uh, Ronnie Garden was there and He's like, you know, we do these interviews, you know, hey, Crusher, why you take the, he, you know, pull me out of the ring, you know, why you take this stuff from me, blah, blah, blah. And he finally does his little investigation and finds out what's going on. So he, him and uh, Randy Savage start having matches for my contract. So it ends up, uh, uh, we end, finally end up as I, I come to the arena, they got this big box, you know, and I've been kind of out of, you know, I've been, I'm still a macho man. They think I'm, you know, hiding out at the house or whatever. But I'm in the box. They, and Ronnie Garvin's on Ronnie Garvin's side. But I got a mask on and I got this striped yellow suit on. They call me the Canadian Bumblebee because Ronnie Garvin's from Canada. So anyway, I come out out of the box. You know, everybody knows, you know, I was Crusher Broomfield. So even, my, you know, Savage and all of them, you know, it's, it's, it wasn't trying to hide my identity. It was just, you know, the idea you got a mask on, they can't prove it. We know that you, Crusher Broomfield, and whatever. So I teamed up with Ronnie Garvin, and we had a couple of tag matches, and finally he wins my contract, and they switched me babyface, you know, which it, it was a good, you know, for me it worked. 
because it took so long to do it. It wasn't a rush job, you know. Yeah. And I stayed there for almost two years, you know. We, I lived with Paz Watley and a couple other guys. We just all basically shared one apartment, kind of just jumbled up together and wasn't making any money, you know. If you made, you know, a hundred dollars for the week, you know, you're like, wow, this is, you know, I'm making. But you're doing what you love to do. That was the whole point of it, you know. You. This is what I wanted to do. I didn't have no idea where it would go past that. For me, that was just the moment right then. Past that, I had no idea. Who did you learn the most from in the early days? The early days, uh, uh, well, I mean, just watching, basically. I'd watch Savage and watch their interviews and things like that. And, and you know, I talked with Lanny a lot. Leaping Lanny gave me pointers about, you know, you're a big man, you need to work a certain way, you know. Because I was always, you know, I always wanted to just, I thought you just get hit and you fly over the top rope or something, you know. Uh, I didn't, to me, I didn't realize I was, you know, six foot nine and 450 pounds. It didn't, I wasn't working that way at the time. And then finally, you know, they, they guys would tell you, you know, you got to work a certain way because you're a big man, you know, you got to do this or do this. Ba basically, it's just, you know, the veterans, you know, the guys that had been in the business before me would come and tell me things, you know, you got to do this or do that, you know. Basically, that's, I'd try it and if it worked, it worked. If it didn't, I'd do something else, you know, same with interviews, I was terrified of the camera, you know, and they just said, you know, just go out there and just relax and cut it, you know, just cut your interview, if you mess up, we'll stop it and do it again, you know, it's no big deal, just, so finally I just got over that fear, I was, I was terrified of cameras, I couldn't stand them, you know. So basically the veterans were pretty helpful to you, was oh, anybody yeah, trying to hold you back sure. or anything? No, no, nobody ever tried to hold you back until, you know, later on when I was leaving, they weren't too happy about that. Yeah. Uh, time at leaving, you went on to Bill Watts Mid South. Right, I went to Bill. Well, before that, before I went to Mid South, I didn't even know what Mid South was. They, you know, uh, I was. They brought in the Big Cat Ernie Ladd, and him and I was scheduled. You know, him and I worked some matches, three or four matches, for in ICW. And uh, I guess he was pretty well impressed with you know my performance with him because he went back to, to Bill Watts in Mid South and said, "Man, they got this dude up there. You know, big old dude, Crusher Broomfield." you got to get him, you know, bring him in. So basically that's, then they got in touch with the Poffos and they worked out a little deal to fly me in to, you know, to do this little video shoots for Mid-South and then I can kind of, I mean, I, when I first came into Mid-South after that, I didn't even have a name. Uh, they didn't want to use Crusher Broomfield, they didn't like it. I was, I was like a mystery man, basically, I just, I can, I mean, if you want to hear the story about that, I can tell you that one. Go right? ahead. All right. This is after ICW. I'm coming into Mid South, you know, and the Pop folks them, they were already hot at me because they they thought I was gonna stay there the rest of my life, I guess, you know, which I I guess I did too. I didn't know there was life after that. But uh, anyway, they uh, they made a deal for me to come into Mid uh, Mid South. Uh, I think my first night was Baton Rouge. I, I flew in to Baton Rouge, and uh, General Scandor Akbar picks me up at the airport. Matches are already in progress at the Centroplex. I go in, you know, I don't have a name. I don't, I don't even know what I'm doing, you know. I'm not scheduled on the card. So what happens is the, during the match, they got the cameras. They always bring the cameras to the shows. They're videotaping. I think it was like Dusty Rhodes or somebody, you know, was working. And when a certain spot hit, I, you know, here I go. I hit the ring, you know, and I laid him out. Boom, boom, boom. Busted him open, you know, and gave him the big splash off. This is back when I could splash off the turnbuckle. I can't do that now. But <laughs> I splashed him off the turnbuckle and, and basically laid him out, you know, there was no, I didn't just stay in there beating on him, you know, I just laid him out, splashed him, boom, and I was out of the ring, and they brought the stretchers in, you know, the man, you know, he couldn't, he was all that, 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 and bleeding and everything, so they bring the stretchers in, they stretchered him out. So the next week they fly me in for another show, it's in New Orleans, another uh, top, one of their top baby faces is in the match, I do the same exact thing, I run in, run out to the ring, boom, 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 lay the dude out splash him, they stretch him out to the hospital. And finally, the big cat Ernie Lads wanted to switch with the Samoans. He was the Samoans manager, the wild Samoans off of Zika. He managed them and he was, he was wanting to switch. So we done a little deal where it's the same thing. I hit the ring on Ernie, Ernie Lad, boom, boom, and laid him out, put his knee up on the corner and splashed, you know, splashed his knee. And uh, they filmed all that, you know, they actually went into the hospital and filmed his knee operation, you know, and all that, so. I did this like four different times, and they, and they were putting it all to, you know, they'd show it, and they was doing the commentating, they're going, well, man, we don't know who this, this is, Scandal Akbar brought this man in, we don't even know where he's from, we don't know anything about him, you know, 
So right right before I'm starting to come in full time to the territory, they they play the, the all these tapes. Me, you know, did Dusty Rhodes, uh, all these top baby faces, the big cat or ain't lad, and I'm destroying them. You know, here I am a nobody. I'm destroying these guys, and Jim Ross and uh, Boyd Pierce doing the commentary over the voiceover on the videotape says he's a one man gang, and there you had it. From then on, when I first came in, I was a one-man gang, and I didn't even have, uh, I didn't have any preliminary matches. You know, I usually go into the territory, you start at the bottom, you know, you slowly beat some TV guys, because the way they did it that way, as soon as I came in, I was like main events, you know, with Dusty and, you know, Dick Murdoch and, uh, you know, them type big-name stars, you know. What was it like working guys like Dusty and Dick Murdoch when, you know, you're, you're still pretty fresh in the business? Yeah, it was business. like, uh, it was a dream come true. Yeah. I mean, it's honestly like you, some, you just think somebody's going to wake you up, you know, you got to wake up, time to get up <laughs> to school, or whatever, you know, whatever. It's just, I tell people nowadays, you know, I just can't believe, you know, I'm, a, you know, if I'm in, I, I've teamed with Ric Flair, I've teamed with Andre, I've wrestled Andre, I've teamed with all these guys and wrestled them, and I'm like, I'm in the dressing room with them, sitting beside them or whatever, and I'm still like, man, this ain't right. You know, it's, it's, something ain't right here. I don't feel, you know, I mean, I understand. I guess I'm on the same level as these guys. We're in the same matches or whatever, but I'm still like, a, you know, I'm a kid from Spartanburg, South Carolina. I'm like, man, this, this can't be happening. It's hard to explain. What was Dusty like back in the day? Was he very willing to put you over that way? Or? No, not at all. Okay. Not at all. <laughs> For one of first time I was going to jump him, you know, he didn't know who I was. We, you know, talked in the back or whatever. He, he didn't trust me. And then, you know, he had a certain signal, you know, and he, it was so obvious. He was like, like waving his head like this. And then when I came in, he, I guess he thought I was going to just hammer him, you know, he was like all crunched up, you know. And, but after that, he was pretty, once they get to trust you, you know, once they kind of trust you, it's all right. But that first time in there with guys, they, if they don't know who you are, and I'm the same way, if I don't know somebody, I don't trust them. You know, but uh, no, he, physical part he didn't. He didn't want to put me over. <laughs> and basically, he never did put me over. Even when we was in Florida. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, you were also managed by Jim Cornette for about two or three months. Yeah, that? two or three months yeah. of agony. <laughs> <laughs> well, what was Cornette like? Cornette was a uh, well. As a manager, he's. I mean, I think he's a great manager. I liked his gimmick and all that, but uh, he just didn't really help my career too much. <laughs> the one man gang and Jim Cornette just didn't fit together for some reason. There's I don't just no know. chemistry. No chemistry at all. Okay. I, I don't know what it was. <laughs> what, what were your first impressions of Bill Watts? Bill Watts. Uh, my first night in, I met him. Uh, we we had some kind of little talk at the hotel about you know uh, I want to bring you in full time, and basically Bill Watts to me was just all business. I mean, he just—he he was just completely business all the way. I mean, if you—he uh, uh, had all these little uh, rules about fines or whatever. If you was late to the bill, and he'd fine you this or whatever. And uh, at one time, uh, Mike Sharp was supposed to be in the ring. Iron Mike Sharp, I guess everybody knows him. But he was supposed to be in the ring for his match, and he was up in the upper bleachers, upper balcony, exercising. Uh, I don't know if everybody, if you don't know Mike Sharp, Mike Sharp would get to the building, he'd start exercising, jump rope, push-ups, whatever. I mean, he just exercised, you know. So he was up in the upper balcony. Where's Mike Sharp? He's supposed to be in the ring. Well, he's up there exercising. So from then on, Bill Watts says, if you exercise in the building, you're going to get fined $500. <laughs> 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 so it's like... <laughs> Do you think that Watts was too strict? No, nah, I mean, that... At that particular time, I guess not. I mean, you got a business, you got to take care of it, right? I mean, I mean, now I go to wrestling shows, you know, independent shows or whatever, and the dress rooms just full of people. I don't know, you know, who's who or who's. I guess they're all smart, but back, you know, in mid South days, I mean, you you couldn't even order a Coca Cola. The the, so the man couldn't even bring a Coke in the dress room. They'd kick him out. You know, if somebody wouldn't, if you wasn't part of that show or what was going on, you wasn't allowed anywhere in that dressing room. What, what, what did you think of Bill Watts as a booker? Was he doing? I thought he was great. Uh, yeah, well, he was. He had, of course, he had help. You know, Grizzly yeah. Smith and Ernie Ladd and all them kind. It was a combination, but mainly the finishes with Bill Watts, which was like two miles long. <laughs> I mean, it's like if you're in, you know, all right, uh, if you're in a tag match, I mean, it starts. 15 minutes before the end of the match. All right, uh, the gang, you tag so-and-so, blah, blah. He comes in and he blasts him and does him, and then you tag him. I mean, it was like 30 or 40 spots you got to memorize for the match. And uh, if you messed up one spot when you got back, he'd give you a chewing out, you know. It was 
<laughs> you had to almost have cheat cards, you know, written out. You know, what am I supposed to do next? <laughs> All right. <laughs> but uh, I mean, but he was hardcore. You know, he liked it rough and tough, and uh, it was no. I mean, if, you, if that was your gimmick, whatever your gimmick was, you better live that gimmick because he knew what was going on. Because you know, he had his little stooges, Grizzly Smith, and everybody knows. You know, that was. You know, they call him up. Oh, so and so. If you, you know, if you got in a bar fight, you better win that bar fight too. Yeah, he'd uh, fire you if you lost the bar fight. He'd fire you. Right? He'd fire you for sure. Yeah. But I mean, he had his little rules. But I mean, he was doing big business at that time too. I got, you know, I can't blame the man. Yeah. How about Jim Ross? What was he like back then? Uh, Jim Ross. Uh, Jim Ross. Uh, I, I thought he was a great announcer. I always thought he was a great announcer. But uh, I mean, I never realized. I didn't think he'd go as far as he's ever went. Yeah. You know, I never visual, visualized him doing that. But uh, I thought Jim Ross was great for that time, what he did, you know. Now, you also had a chance to compete on some of the bigger Superdome cards. Um, there was one uh, where you were in a tag against Andre, yeah. teaming up with Harley Race, and Dick Murdoch was Andre's partner. There was another one against Ernie Ladd and Buck Robley. What was it like being on those Superdome cards? Any memories spring to mind from those matches? Well, the Superdome was always, you know, as like your big uh, special of the year. Uh, like they have now, WrestleMania. I guess that was Bill Watts' WrestleMania type show with Superdome. So I remember, uh, I mean, the main thing I remember is basically they'd have the, uh, to get you to the ring and so far away, they'd have these little carts. You had to ride in a little golf cart. And, uh, and me, I think it was me and Kamala, had to ride in the back of one of them golf carts. We sat in the back in the front end, lifted off the ground. <laughs> the guy was like, hey, wait a second. That thing was like squashed to the ground. It was both 450. And uh, the thing with Harley Race and him, uh, the tag match, they I'm not a big drinker. I don't drink alcohol. You know, pretty much everybody in the dressing room knows this. So they set up a little thing with Andre. Uh, redneck, Captain Redneck Dick Murdoch, he always carried his little backpack. He'd have beer in his backpack, you know, which, you know, I, I didn't. I didn't even think about it. So we're in there working and working and working and working the match. And everybody was in on it except me. So they... Andre hooks me. When Andre hooks you, you ain't going nowhere. So Andre hooks me and takes me over to where uh, Captain Redneck Dick Murdoch is, and these guys back to me. I don't know what he's doing. I see him shaking like this. So Andre says, now, boss. So I looked that way, and they shoved that beer in my mouth after being shook up, you know, shoved it in my mouth, and it was like just a jet <laughs> going down my throat and everywhere else. I'm just gagging and coughing. Man, they laughed. They thought that was so funny. <laughs> you know, Andre, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> Jeez, you know, and everybody was a Harley Race was even in on it. <laughs> These guys, I mean, here we are, the you know, biggest show of the year, the Superdome, and they in there playing practical jokes, except it's on me. Jeez. Did, did, did they say anything to you in the locker room, or did you say anything? Oh, to they asked me, oh, what did it taste like? <laughs> How you like that, huh? And all that. They just basically rib you, you know, just. <laughs> what was Andre like? What was it like to work him? Uh, to work him, he was a great worker. Uh, First time I worked him, I basically was flying all over the place for him. I think he came into uh, Mid-Atlantic when I went to Mid-Atlantic. It was later after Mid-South, but uh, I, 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 worked, well, I worked him in that. But later on in Mid-Atlantic, when I was more of a top heel, you know, I worked him. and I was flying all over the place. I thought, well, this is Andre the Giant. That's what you do, you know. And he took me to the side, you know, hey, boss, I come here to make you look good, you know. You don't, you don't need to be doing all that and blah. You know, well, he, he didn't have to say that, you know. Yeah. And, but, I mean, if Andre liked you, he really liked you. If he didn't like you, you know, it's the other side, too. You know, I, 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 I know years later, a thing with him and Bam Bam Bigelow, a little incident, you know. He well, didn't, well, I think Bam Bam Bigelow, uh, I don't know, it was in WWF. He got a paycheck or something. He was griping about it. I don't, it was, I don't know what it's for, like nine grand or something, you know. And he was griping, man, look at this. This is, you know, blah, it sucks, whatever. You know, Andre's in the dressing room, he hears it, you know, and uh, they work on each other that night in the garden, and they do, the, they, I guess, uh, uh, Andre hooks himself in the ropes, that old standard where he used to hook himself in the ropes, you know, and the spot usually is Bigelow hit the other side, and this one, Andre was a heel. Hits the other side, I guess, gives him the shoulder or whatever, you know, so he thought that's what was going to happen. Though. Bigelow comes running full force to give him the shoulder, and Andre picks that big boot up, you know, and booted him in his mouth. And I think he loosened a couple of his teeth and all that. So, I mean, you know what I mean? If he liked you, you know, he liked you. If you said something stupid like that, I mean, who's going to gripe about $9,000? <laughs> you know, but guys would do it. Did you ever see the, the bad side of Andre or the, not, with you personally? No, not with me. Like I had no trouble with the man. I mean, because I, I guess 
I don't know why. I, I mean, I showed the man respect. You know, I mean, to me, this is like this is Andre the Giant. You know, a lot of a lot of guys in the dressing room didn't look at it that way. I mean, this is. I guess growing up as a wrestling fan, you know, I mean, and I paid money to see this man, and here I am in there with him, you know, I mean, I was like in awe of the man, golly, I mean, he's a giant, he honestly was, <laughs> you know, but I had no trouble with him, Not, I mean, I couldn't really understand him in the ring, you know, if he called something, he can't understand him, because he had that, you know, that accent and all that, but other than that, actual working-wise, I had no trouble at all with him. Now, another uh, big baby face in Mid-South at the time was Junkyard Dog. What was it like working dog? Junkyard dog. Uh, he was the baby face at one time until Jim Duggan took over a little bit later on. But uh, junkyard dog, I mean, you go basically anywhere you go, especially New Orleans was the worst. You got uh, 15,000 people in New Orleans at the municipal auditorium. And, uh, I mean, 15,000 and probably 14,000 is black. You know, and they all like, they start that little chant, they go, who that? Who dad gonna beat that dog? <laughs> you know, and I'm in there working against the dog, and you get him down and start hit, beating on him, working him over, and he starts that, help me, help me, and uh, you know the barricade just slowly start to slide. You know, to, they start moving in on you, moving in. So basically, what would happen? New Orleans was the worst. It happened in a lot of other cities, in Louisiana, because the wrestling fan. I mean, it's not like now. They're not smart. They believe. What they saw on TV, they honestly believed. That's, I mean, so uh, after the show, you know, you'd be out back. You'd have to you'd come out back. They'd be throwing rocks at you. They'd throw out. I, I was trying to leave one time and had a couple of Gatorade bottles smash into my vehicle. And so it got so bad, you'd have to, I'd have my wife pull my vehicle up to the door if I was in the main event last match. I'd have all my clothes and everything in the vehicle. So the match would end, I'd run, you know, run straight from the ring, straight out to my car, you know, and you have to, that's the only way you could get out without being mobbed, you know. Not a friendly mob either, <laughs> you know, so. Skandar anyway. Akbar, he did one of the straight shooting interviews with us, and he was talking about how people used to follow him and shoot at him and that kind of stuff. Did you ever All have the time. Like that? Uh, I had, I, when I was in world class, is another years later, when I was in world class, I had some threats against me on the telephone, and, uh, I don't know why, but somebody came up on my porch and put it like a bag and had a big old dead rat in it. Really? I mean, why would somebody do that? That's <laughs> sick. <laughs> but anyway, I mean, I've got threats. Well, you know, I've had threats, and I've had, I've actually been in the ring and, and objects, you know, uh, big whiskey bottles just splattered in the ring and things like that, you know. Luckily, I wasn't hit with it. But, uh, it did, I mean, it exploded right beside I mean, They're not even thinking, you know, it explodes, it's going to hit some little kid at ringside, you know, put his eye out or something. I don't even know uh, people are crazy. But were there ever any times outside the ring when you were concerned for your own safety? Outside the ring? Yeah. Uh, that was all the time. Yeah. Any time. At that particular time, it's not now, but at that particular time, I mean, it didn't matter if you went into a mini mart or a uh, place to eat. I mean, the, as soon as you walked in, because the Mid-South UWF was so strong, you know, I mean, the, there was no hiding. Everybody knew who you was, you know. I didn't trust anybody yeah. at that time, you know. Just looking back at the first Mid-South run, was there any uh, matches or angles that stand out as your favorites or that stand out as stuff that you really didn't like? I, I liked all of it, to be honest with you. I mean, yeah. to me, the, I mean, I, even matches I wasn't involved in, I watch it, you know, I watch old tapes now, and I, was, I mean, that was some good wrestling. Yeah. That was good stuff. But uh, the stuff I was involved with, I liked it all, basically. I mean, as before the actual. One man gang. I mean, uh, the real gimmick later on. I got the Mohawk and all that. It was I hadn't really established a character yet. I was just a wild street fighter, basically, you know. But I mean, I had a good time in Mid South. It was hard, hard work. Believe me. I mean, we traveled the roads up and down the roads, thousands of miles driving. We weren't flying. We were driving. Yeah. You know, we had to go to Oklahoma, Mississippi, wherever. You know, from you know, and have to be there one night and all the way down to the south end the next night. Or TV or whatever, you know, but I didn't know. Uh, to me, it was just, I was having time in my life. You know, we had doubles on weekends, you know. Summertime, you do double shots. You do a afternoon show, you know, and then had to run and leave your gear on and, you know, race to the next show that night, you know. So, you know, but uh, I was having time in my life. I loved it. What was the uh, party and drug scene like in Mid-South? Mid-South, to me, I didn't, I mean, actual, you know, the guys would go out to the bars and have a good time, of course, you know, but. <clears throat> drug wise, I didn't I didn't notice any drug big drug usage at all in Mid South. I mean, most of the guys they were 
they were pretty professional about their job. I mean, it just seemed like they really cared about what they were doing. You know, they wanted to go out there and have a good show, entertain the people. You know, and, it, and like I said, Bill Watts was, he was, he wanted everything like so real. You know, I mean, he'd tell you, if you, you hit that man with a cheer, you better hit him with it. You know, and things like that. You know, it was just unbelievable. Now, uh, what, what led to you leaving Mid-South the first time? Uh, I left Mid-South just because basically my time was up. I mean, you just, I mean, they run you as long as they can run you as a heel, you know, at that, at that particular time. Then they, you know, call another territory. I didn't even, you know, you don't even have to do it as a worker to a Bill Watts to call another territory and say, I got, you know, one-man gang. Can you use them wherever, you know? So I left there. My time was up. I did my loser leave town, basic type matches with whoever. Then I went to Memphis. I went over to Memphis territory for about two months, starved to death. Bill called me on the phone. Oh, how's it going? I said, man, I'm starving to death. You need to get me out of this place. It was god awful over there. Yeah. You know, no money. I mean, I I was on the booking sheet. I'd show up to a town. They tell me I'm not booked. You know, after driving all the way and uh, and that's for Jerry Jarrett. Yeah, Jared. Uh, the little group over there, Lawler and Jerry and them guys. And then uh, that's the first time at Coco Beware. I went to some, I don't know how far I drove, 200, 300 miles. I get there and they go, well, you're not on the booking sheet. Well, yes, I am. I'm right there. I'm on the booking sheet. Well, we ain't, we ain't got nothing for you. So I'm leaving and Coco's outside and he goes, what's 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 happening? I said, well, they told me I'm not booked, you know, and I'm, I'm on the sheet right there. He goes, don't go anywhere. He went inside. He come back like with 20 bucks for gas, you know. So that was pretty nice. Thing. I didn't know the guy from nobody, but that was, you know, that was my first time meeting him. That was pretty nice of him to do that for me. Yeah. I got out of that place. I couldn't stand it. What was Jerry Lawler like? Uh, I didn't like him. Yeah. I'll just be honest. You know, some guys you just don't like. To me, like I said, I wouldn't. Uh, I wasn't in that little Memphis clique. Yeah. You know, if you're not in that little Memphis clique, you're just not in. You know. And even years later, when I went to WWF and whatever, you know, he was announcing and all that. I used he just do his little greeting and hey and blah 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 and that's it, you know. Yeah. So then after uh, Memphis, um, I believe you worked. Uh, you went to Florida and Central States and Toronto. Yeah, well, I went to. Uh, well, after Memphis, I went to Mid Atlantic. Okay. Mid Atlantic Championship Wrestling, which was my home, you know. Now it's like a dream come true, you know. I'm getting to wrestle like I thought it'd be great, but then you know you can't go home and wrestle. It's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I went to Mid Atlantic for the Crockett's. You know, Jim Crockett and all them guys, and ended up being in uh, the house of Humperdinck. Sir Oliver Humperdinck was my manager. So that was a, uh, I mean, I, we did some good business there. My, my main feud in, in uh, Mid Atlantic was Boogie Woogie Man, Jimmy Valiant, him, uh, Crazy Bugsy McGraw, they brought him in. We, I mean, we ran all over, all over the Mid Atlantic area with that, you know. So that was pretty good. I mean, but. You just can't work at home. I mean, I'm in my hometown, you know, and it's like, hey, I went to school with you. And I'm out there trying to be a heel, you know. I'm a heel, one-man gang, and I'm, hey, I know you, that's George. Hey, 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 you know, that's great. I hated working at home. <laughs> you think it's going to be great, you know. I'm going home, I'm on Mid-Atlantic now. This is your dream. You watched this growing up, man. It was god-awful. <laughs> <laughs> what were the Crockett's like to work for? Crockett's, uh, payoff-wise, they... To me, they wasn't the greatest, you know. Uh, I felt they could have utilized me a little better than what they did, you know. But just, uh, you know, if I just didn't, for some reason, I don't know if they didn't like me or whatever. They just didn't use me on big shows or anything. I was always, you know, off on some little town or whatever. And I mean, I did get the Mid-Atlantic Tag Team titles with Kelly Kaninsky. Yeah. That was the only, you know, thing, you know, I can say I did there. I carried those with Kaninsky. But then we ended up losing them to... I think I, I had to drop the fall to Rufus R. Jones with the freight train. You yeah. know, it's like Humperdinck went in the office and said, man, why are you going to beat this man for? You know, you got this man, he's, you know, almost seven foot tall, 500 pounds, and you're going to let Rufus R. Jones beat him with a freight train. How's that going to help your business? You know, it didn't do any good. They still beat me. Yeah. yeah. How was Oliver Humperdinck to work with? Oliver Humperdinck was great. I yeah. mean, you know, he's we. He went back years and years ago. He used to uh, be with the Hollywood Blondes, the original Blondes. You know, I think it was Buddy Roberts and whoever. You know, was original Hollywood Blondes. But uh, yeah, he was great too. I mean, you know, we didn't travel that much together because we kind of had differing habits. Yeah. You know, he's got a certain lifestyle he likes to live, and you know, I just didn't care too much for that lifestyle. And 
But as a manager, I thought he was great, you know. And then after Mid-Atlantic, where did you go? Mid-Atlantic, well, I always, every place I left, I always came back to Mid-South. That's why people, okay. I guess people think I've just stayed in Mid-South forever, but I, everywhere I went, even when I was in Mid-Atlantic or wherever I was at, I'd come back to Mid-South and do two weeks or whatever. So I was like kind of constantly always on TV. So I'd always come back after there. I might come back to Mid-South for two or three or four months. Then I'd get booked somewhere else. And that's where I finally ended up going to Florida. Dusty came into Mid-South. Uh, worked some matches with him around, you know, in the Mid-South area. And then he finally said, man, you'd be interested in coming to Florida, you know. Heck yeah, I would be. You know, so basically that's how it happened. He was, he was the booker in Florida, basically run it. You know, Eddie Graham really run it, but he kind of, you know, had a big say so. So he needed a big hill to work with down there. So uh, what do you think of Dusty Rhodes as a booker? I thought he was great. Yeah. I thought his, his mind was like unbelievable for angles and, you know, finishes and whatever you needed. You know, it was like unbelievable. I mean, I couldn't do it, I'll tell you that. I mean, you come up with finishes for every match, you know. You got seven matches on the card or whatever, and you got to have a finish for every one. And then, you know, of course, your main events, you want to have, I mean, there's always some kind of gimmick going on, you know, always something going on. And I thought, and then you got your TVs, you always got to keep your angles hot on TV, you come up with all that TV stuff. I thought it was unbelievable. Did you like working the Florida Territory? I thought that was one of my favorite places. I like, how come? I like living on living vacation. <laughs> I mean, you know, you work and you right there in Florida, you basically home almost every night except Miami or you know West Palm Beach. Ever all the other towns, you're basically local. I lived right outside of Tampa in Bradenton, Florida. So you go fishing, do whatever. And then uh, you know you work and work wise, matches really wasn't that hard. A lot of blood. That's the only you know my head was always messed up. But other than that. I mean, you're working with Dusty, all you got to do is run into his elbows and <laughs> take a couple of, you know, falls here and there, and he gives you the big flying elbow. It's basically over, you know. I mean, it was work-wise, it wasn't nothing. It wasn't like the Watts style where Watts was telling you guys to really lay it in. No, it was more of an entertainment, yeah. more of an entertainment style. I mean, how, how can it be, you know, real when he, he in a tag match, he's over here hitting one guy, the other guy comes in, he starts hitting <laughs> us both, you know. <laughs> I mean, how can that be real? He gives us both to flip flop and fly, you know. <laughs> we all take big bumps for him, and that's. <laughs> did you enjoy the entertainment style more than like the walk style? I did. I thought it was fun. I mean, to me, it was just didn't kill your body as much, you know. You, you know, and, and it was just easier for some reason. I, to me, it was more. You just go out there and have a good time with the fans, you know, and just do what you had to do. I mean, only really tough matches uh, were worked angle Blackjack Mulligan, you know. So I mean, with him, you, he, you had to be. I mean, he was kind of snug, so I had to be snug back with him. But, you know, other than that, working with Dusty or some of them other guys, it was a night off every night, you know. Was uh, it tough making an adjustment to the more entertainment style? Well, Is there anybody who really taught you or you learned from? No, not really. You just go out there, basically, you get in the ring, you just learn to do it, you know. I mean, bleeding-wise, I was, uh, you know, from Mid-South, I'd already learned that, you know. I mean, I knew how to bleed, and basically, f with Dusty, I mean, that's every night. You know, you're always in a bull roll match, you got a cage match, you Texas death matches or whatever. Every night was a gimmick match. So you automatically going to be bleeding. As long as you can bleed good, that's all they cared about, you know. What was the whole idea behind the Panama Gang angle that you did down there? The Panama Gang angle came about, uh, uh, they was working up a big angle. Ric Flair was the NWA champion at that time. He was going to come in and work uh, Dusty in Miami at the big stadium show or something, uh, ring, ring of Champions or something like that, but the NWA title, two out of three falls. So the whole deal was everybody, you know, everybody knew that Ric Flair was the master of the figure four. So me and Dusty had a TV match, and basically what, what happened, he put the figure four on me, he wouldn't release it. So I ended up supposedly breaking my leg, you know, tearing some knee cartilage, they carted me out. So the next week I came back on TV with the cane and I was all, had a little Panama hat and a little Hawaii looking shirt with some yellow Bermuda shorts on, white socks, <laughs> tennis shoes and a cane and had a cigar and they started calling me Panama Gang as a manager. So I, was, I managed Black Bart for a couple of months, you know, until the Ric Flair angle, whatever, went over, you know. So that's basically how that happened. I was just a manager. Were you, uh, was there any reason that they took you out of the ring during that time? Well, 
just because of the angle when they showed it, it you know. A, it wasn't like you were really injured and you needed time off? Or no, no, I didn't need the time off. It was just they wanted to shoot that angle to show that, you know, Dusty Rhodes' figure four is just as powerful as, you know, nature boy Ric Flair, so he breaks my leg with the figure four. You know, basically just to uh, have me at ringside then, you know, I'm not really doing anything, just sitting there making a paycheck. Whose idea was, like, the whole outfit of Panama game? Did, did, you, did you like doing that? Just, uh, I think we just sit down one day, me and Dusty, and uh, just came up with his, you know, he said just come up with some outlandish-looking, Panama-looking clothes, you know, yeah. Panama gang. And that was actually when I started cutting some, you know, I had to start cutting a little better interviews and things because I was a manager then, so I was talking for my wrestlers. But uh, managing the world, it wasn't too bad a little gig. I kind of was like, man, this is all right. Yeah. You know, you basically run around and trip people, and <laughs> that's all right. <laughs> hey, God, I'm, I'm sitting in rings, so I'm watching the whole thing. Yeah, that's a good chair. Hit him again. <laughs> that was a pretty good gig. That didn't last long, though. <laughs> then you had a, uh, a U.S. tag title ran with Ron Bass down there, too. Yeah, I had so. tag team titles for a while with Cowboy Ron Bass. Uh, I mean... Yeah, well, then uh, Kevin Sullivan came in. We did a little thing with Kevin Sullivan. I remember we was at, we was at the Eddie Graham Sports Center when Eddie Graham was still alive. He was, we was all sitting back there talking before the show. And, and Eddie Graham, uh, he was like a pure wrestler. He liked wrestling, you know. He's like, well, you know, t- talking to Cut Sullivan about me. And I'm standing there. I'm like, man, this dude's just talking about me. And he said, you know, on the marquee it says wrestling. You know, because I wasn't no wrestler. I, I still don't know how to wrestle, you know. I don't know nothing about it. I know how to fight and hit somebody with a chair. You know, but he said, you know, you know, Sullivan on the marquee, it says wrestling. And Sullivan looked at me, he goes, says, Eddie, look at that man. He's a living gimmick. He can't wrestle. <laughs> so <laughs> he goes, yeah, you might be right. <laughs> what was Kevin Sullivan like? Kevin Sullivan was uh like I said, he was the same as anybody else. I mean, he was good. He helped me a lot. Uh, I mean, his little devil thing I thought was a great gimmick at that particular time, you know. He had the golden spike, spiking people with it. And luckily, I was involved in that, you know. And Florida was another place where I actually got to turn babyface. I was only – ICW in Florida was the only two times I actually was a real babyface, you know, where people were behind you chanting for you and doing the whole gimmick. That's the only time. How do you like being a babyface? I didn't like it. Yeah. I like being a heel better, just easier. Babyface, you got to work too much. Cause you, you, know, you constantly got to be in, you know, hey, I, 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 and, you know, come on and do this, stomp your foot, whatever. You always got to be moving. The heel, all you got to do is just make them mad at you. And that's easy to do. You just, you know, f- cuss them or whatever. You know, you stink or shut your mouth. That's easy. But as a babyface, it was hard. They did it right. I mean, it took their time and they really stretched it out. I could tell you the story about that. Yeah. All right, well. In Florida, I mean, I was the, I guess in Florida, me and Ron Bass, we were kind of the heel at the time, you know. I mean, I destroyed everybody. And Dusty was leaving, going to Crockett's to take over the Crockett territory. So he told me, you know, just stay here and ride it out. I said, all right. So they come up with his little gimmick before he left because they needed a baby face. Before he left, uh, I was in the house of Humperdinck. It was me, superstar Billy Graham, cowboy Ron Bass. We was like the house of Humperdinck. And uh, a couple of, a month prior on TV tapings, you know, like they'd give me the microphone to say something, Humperdinck and Snatches, you don't need to be saying anything, whatever. During the match, I may drop the fall, whatever happens, I lose the match, you know, Humperdinck get in my face, what are you doing, you know, blah, blah, he really get on me about it, you know. And the people slowly were starting, to, man, what are you taking, you know, you know, and I, I'd always, you know, we'd slowly tease them, like, you know, I'd look at the people and look at Humperdinck, you know, and Humperdinck could give me the old money sign, yeah, yeah, yeah. So finally, uh, me and Dusty's working a Texas death match in Lakeland, Florida. And it ends up, I don't know how many falls we split. And I don't know if people don't know what a Texas death match is. Falls don't count. You basically, you can pin the man, you know, 100 times. Then you got a 10 count to get to your feet. If you're not on your feet by a 10 count, you lose the match. So we, you know, we, he's already bleeding. I hadn't, uh, mine's later, but I hadn't started bleeding. We split falls, I don't know, four or five different times. It ends up something where we uh, collide together, boom, he goes down. Then uh, Humperdinck starts waving like this, you know, so the people know right away what's happening. Here comes, here comes the troops. Here comes the house of Humperdinck. So here comes uh, superstar Billy Graham and Ron Bass, and 
And all the people in the building is thinking, man, they're going to get on Dusty, you know, so they all screaming, but they don't get on Dusty, they get on me. Uh, superstar Billy Graham hooks me, you know, and the people are like, what the heck? And Ron Bass took his cowboy boot off and comes off the top turnbuckle, and, you know, I give it the old gimmick, you know. And then uh, they basically leave me laying there like that, you know. They leave and all that, and Dusty sees what, what's going on. He don't know, and, and I'm laying there bleeding, and he gets all the people chanting, get up, get up, get up. So they all chant, and I finally make it to my feet, the old Rocky pull yourself up kind of gimmick, and, I fall into his arms, you know, and he hugs me, and you know, blah, blah, blah. So I have no, I'm going back to my dressing room. They take the cameras following me, behind me. I get to my dressing room, and all you see is Humperdinck and them guys. They throw all my gear out in the hallway. They throw all my gear, everything. I had a gallon of water. They threw it out there even. I used to wear this old fur-looking thing, you know, before my one-man gang vest. I had this fur thing. Everything was in the hallway. I pick it all up like some beaten little, uh, I'm beating on the door, let me in. Yeah, you're not getting in here, you know all that. And so I have no dressing room. They show me just wandering off down the hallway to some bathroom or something, you know. So anyway, they show that. And then I have no dressing for like the next couple of three weeks. I have, I'm like in no man's land. I'm neither here nor there. And like uh, Ron Bass might be working Mike Rotundo or somebody like that. And just out of the blue, I'd come stomping through the people, you know, just right through the middle of them, you know, and boom, 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 I'd jump in the ring and start wailing on Bash, you know, just knock him around and leave. And finally, you know, it comes up to a big tag team match. I need a partner. It's Ron Bass, superstar Billy Graham against me. I have no partner. So, you know, I'm like, hey, American Dream, be my partner or whatever. So he cuts this really good interview about, you know, one man gang, I'll be a partner. But if you turn on me, I'll hunt you down, but I'll hunt you down to the ends of the earth. You know, it's kind of like that little gimmick, you know, I'll be a partner. So hey, we end up being partners, and at the very finish of the match, you know, we do this thing where the the heel drops down, and then Dusty comes off with the cross body, and I catch him, you know, in the cross body. And the people's thinking, oh man, they think I'm going to turn on him, they think I'm going to slam him, but instead, when the, the heel turns around, I chunk him back on the heel, you know, one, two, three. So from then on, I was a baby face. You know, Dusty left, and I kind of took over the baby face reign, which was, it worked because they did it so good, you know. Yeah. And then uh, I started working this little angle with the Russians, Crusher Khrushchev, who later became Smash, Axe and Smash Demolition guy. He was working as the Russian then, Crusher Khrushchev. Him and the uh, mask guy, Cuban assassin, and uh, did a thing where I had the long hair back then. So we did this angle where they jumped me and cut my hair, you know, and all that. So I, I was going to work some big angles with them, and then a contract came up. I, was, I had to go to Japan. So I left. I went to Japan for like five weeks. We did a, Before I left, we did an angle where they put me out. You know, I went to Japan. I worked my little gimmick in Japan. I come back into Florida. Michael Hayes took over. I called Michael up. Hey, Michael, I'm back from Japan. When, you know, when do I start back? He's like, start back? Well, what do you mean start back? We thought you left. I said, well, yeah, I went to Japan, I was coming back, we don't have a spot for you. So here I was, you know, I come back, I'm unemployed, I gotta, I'm living in Florida with no place to work, you know, and luckily he says, well, he says, well, I, uh, call this, you know, he said, call Von Erickson, you know, in Texas, they're looking for a big hill, because I guess they were all right there and they left, you know, the Freebirds, and they, the spot was open, they needed a new hill in, in world class, and basically that's how that came about. Michael got in touch with Fritz and, you know, them guys in world class, and I left Florida, went back to Mid-South for, you know, short little stay, you know, have some bounty matches or whatever you have. I was always the biggest bounty hunter in the world. Every time I come back in, it'd be a bounty on Hacksaw Jim Duggan. I'd be the one trying to collect it. Never got it, though. Why do you think Michael Hayes didn't want to keep the whole baby face thing going in Florida? I don't I, He never has answered that. I, you know, he never has given me an honest answer about why he didn't know. I mean, how would you not know I'm working there? Yeah. I mean, that's just, that didn't even make sense. I mean, anybody with any sense would say, well, yeah, he just, you know, we did this angle. He's left for Japan. He's coming back in. Uh, I never, he never has answered that. How were uh, Superstar Graham and Ron Bass to work with back then? Uh, Superstar Billy Graham, I was kind of past his prime, you know. He wouldn't like, yeah, that's when he was already bald. He wore the green fatigues, you know, just that karate chop. Basically, it was all he could do, you know, uh, really. But, I mean, he liked it just barely touch him. I mean, he liked it just soft as could be, you know what I'm saying, because he's from that old New York school from years ago from when he was, you know, in New York. And Ron Bass, he was... Ron Bass was the same 
basically the same type way, you know, he didn't like nothing stiff, you know, just worn barely, you know, I, I'm totally opposite that way. I'm like, man, you got these people, let's hammer each other, you know, but you got to kind of work the way the guy, you know, to me, the, uh, you know, these were like, uh, not Ryan Bass, I didn't really know Ryan Bass as well, but superstar Billy Graham was a legend to me, yeah. you know, so, I mean, if he don't, you know, if he just wants it light, that's what I give it to him, you know. Was he nice outside the ring? Oh, super nice, super nice guy, you know, he'd give you, you ask him anything about training or diet, anything like that, you know, he'd try to help you as much as possible, you know, yeah. super. You mentioned going to Japan. How did you end up with All Japan? I ended up in Japan uh, at the particular time I was in uh, Mid-Atlantic. I know we seem like we're jumping around, but I've, it's been so many years. I was in Mid-Atlantic Championship Wrestling, and uh, at that particular time, Dory Funk Jr. was the booker in Mid-Atlantic. And uh, he just approached me, uh, asked me if I'd you know, be interested in going to Japan for BABA, you know. I said, well, sure, you know, why? I mean, that's another one of your dreams. My God, you're, you know, going to Japan to wrestle. So basically, that's basically, honestly, how it happens. You just, he just comes to you because he's the booker in Japan, and he just asks you, you want to go to Japan to work? Yeah, I'll go, heck yeah. And they give you an offer, which for me was, you know, now, I mean, compared to what top guys were making, it was nothing. I think I was making 1400 a week or something over there, you know. Which expenses wasn't that high? I don't remember. I think it was like three hundred something yen to a dollar. So it was, that was pretty good, you know, really. Yeah. So I, that's how I basically I got over there. Did you like Japan? I didn't like it. Uh, I didn't like it. Uh, everything was just too small. Yeah. I mean the bathrooms. You, I mean, you couldn't certain rooms you're at. You couldn't close the door. You had to leave the door open because your knees were hitting the door. I mean, no matter any taxi or anything you took, you couldn't fit into it. You just didn't make it for big people. And at that time, like I said, I was close to 500 pounds, you know, and it was just crazy. I didn't, I didn't like it at all. I got to team up with Bruiser Brody, you know, like I said, from years later when he beat the crap out of me till then, you know, here I am teaming up with him, and, you know, in Japan. And, man, you want to talk about a machine, that's a machine right there. That man was a machine. What was Brody like outside the ring? Outside the ring, super nice guy. I mean, real family type oriented, you know. Everything was for his family. But man, you get him, I mean, maybe not so much in the States, but if you get him in Japan, because he was making big, big money in Japan, he was the, he was the man, him and Stan Hansen. Now you get him in Japan, and like I said, he was like crazy. I mean, he was like never, never blow up, you know, or anything. He was just continuously, continuously go and go and go. I remember my first night, first night teaming with him, he said, you know, was going, getting ready to go to the ring here in the back is TV, you know, it's TV taping is a big deal, you know. And he says, just follow my lead, you know. Like, All right. So we go out there, and I, I don't, know, I, I don't know what's going on. I don't. At that time, I didn't have prescription. I wear glasses. I couldn't see too well, you know. All the lights and everything. I lost him. He's gone. I'm in the ring, you know. I get to the ring. I'm in the ring. There's no Bruiser Brody there, you know. And he told me just follow him, you know. I look up in the crowd. He's way up at the top of the darn at the top of the building up there stomping through the people, you know, with that big chain. He carried that chain, he's ah, hitting people, knocking camera people over. I'm like, oh, man, what have I got into? <laughs> and he just he comes right down to the ring. I mean, no, he don't stop or anything. Gets right in the ring, starts, grabs one of the Japanese, throws him in, big drop kick, knocks the guy, you know, takes the other guy and hammers him. And I'm like, I'm just standing there like some goof, you know. <laughs> I'm like, what am I supposed to do? <laughs> So, I mean, like, he was just a machine over there in Japan. But when he come to the States, he really wasn't quite that crazy because you couldn't really do that in the States. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, you can't kick a cameraman and get away with it. <laughs> well, what did you think of the Japanese style of wrestling? I, I didn't like it. Yeah. Uh, for me, all they wanted to do was suplex me. That's all. I mean, that was their big thing. Oh, we 500-pound man, we suplex him. <laughs> so, I mean, every night it was just everybody trying to suplex me. I hated that. You know, it was just a fight. Every night was a fight. You know, honestly, like almost like shooting with them, you know, and I just didn't like I mean, when you got lucky, you might, you may have a tag match against some Americans, you know, something like that, which was like a night off, but the majority of time I was against Japanese, you know, Tenru or somebody like that, and it was just, it was just a fight every night. I hated it. How did the Japanese wrestlers treat you? Uh, at that particular time, they, you know, I really didn't have a well-known name, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't treat it. 
I wasn't treated bad, but I wasn't like, you know, I didn't have no sponsors to take me out or anything like that. So basically, I was kind of on my own. And I was over there five, six weeks at a time. You know, you see the tour halfway to, through the tour, like Brody and uh, some British Bulldogs come in, they'd leave, and I'm still there. You know, I'm like, man, how much longer I got over here? It's like a lifetime. You over there five weeks, it's like a lifetime. It's crazy. I mean, there's so much, I and mean, you can't. TV's paid a little. You got to put a quarter in to watch it, and then you can't understand it. You know, it's just it was crazy. Was there anything about Japan that, that you liked? Uh, not really. <laughs> no, not really. I mean, the crowds were just all polite, like uh, da, 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 and all that bull crap. You know, you just when you're used to American crowds, you know, going crazy and throwing stuff and cussing, you, and you go over there and you're working your butt off. You don't know if you're having a good match because they don't say a word. They sit on their little rice mats. They won't do anything. You know, and I, I I couldn't do, you know, Bruiser Brody had the wild man style, so I was kind of limited, you know. So I, basically I was just a punching bag being suplexed. You ever see any old magazines of me in Japan, that's what you're going to see, me up in the air being suplexed this way or suplexed that way or whatever. And if, if you didn't do it, they're like, oh, they get all mad, you know what I'm saying? They get all crazy with you. Were there any of the Japanese wrestlers that you really liked to work or didn't like to work? Uh, I didn't. I didn't. I worked them. I, I ain't gonna say I didn't like or like to work them. It was just a job. I was, you know, like I said, it's to me. I thought it was a dream thing. I'm going to Japan, you know, until you get there and you see, God, this is awful. You know, for me, some guys love it over there. You know, I guess Brody and Hanson and them guys, they loved it. But my God, they were making what eight grand a week or whatever. You know, yeah. here I was over there making fourteen hundred dollars a week. You know, and plus they had sponsors. They they didn't pay for anything. You know. I had to pay for all my stuff, all my food and whatever was I had to pay for. So that's a big difference when you're, you know, you're going over there for that kind of money. Was there, um, is there any reason you didn't go back to Japan more? Did they try to get you over more? And you just I just didn't, uh, I guess they just, I didn't, either I didn't, they didn't like the way I worked or either they felt I was too close to the bro, Bruiser Brody look, you know. He had that crazy long hair with the big beard, same kind of look I had, you know. I don't know if it was the... To, we look too much alike or whatever it was or maybe they just didn't like the way I looked I don't know they just didn't after the end of the tour you always like well they gonna you expect when you get paid that last night they pay you cash you know you take your draws during the tour and then that last night you get that big your final big payoff you know all American money you know and that's when you find out whether you gonna come back or not they'll say well can you come back in next tour or two months from now whatever you know they never approached me so I just went back to Mid-Atlantic, and I think I went over there like two times for Baba, and I just didn't, whatever, I didn't. How did John Baba treat you? Uh, he didn't, did he, he didn't talk really, to him much? Or? He didn't get to talk to him too much. I mean, the main guys he hung around, he liked Harley Race because they play cards, constantly play cards, gamble, you know, and all that. And so, I mean, I didn't really fit in with that Baba group. I was a youngster. I had to show, you know what I'm saying? You, 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 know, you really hadn't proved yourself to him. And now you mentioned after Florida, you ended up, you ended up in world class. Yeah. Uh, what, what was your first impressions of the world class territory? My first impression, uh, I remember the first time I went down to the Sportatorium, I'm like, God, what a place. You know, I mean, I've been in some pretty big arenas by then, you know, and this is a little Sportatorium. I'm like, golly, what a dump this is. <laughs> yeah, I didn't realize it was so famous. But anyway, it was a man, you know, walking around in this zipped up jumpsuit looking thing. Like, I thought, honestly, I thought he was a janitor. And then come to find out, it was Fritz Von Air. <laughs> so he calls me over there, hey, kid, you know you're going to be working with my boys. Yeah? Yeah, uh, you better make them look good, too. All right. <laughs> That's basically my big conversation, how I started with Fritz. <laughs> well, well, what did you think of Fritz Von Air? What kind of person was he? Uh, like I said, I mean, except for that one, that time right there, and then the, we did that one little angle where he was handcuffed to Gary Hart at the Texas Stadium. That's basically the only time I ever really spoke to the man. Okay. I mean, he, I guess he made the payoffs and whatever, which sometimes they took care of me, sometimes they didn't. But, I mean, if, as long as you took care of his boys, he was happy. So working for Fritz was a lot different than working for Watts? Yeah, Fritz wasn't hands-on. I mean, I guess he was behind the scenes, but he really wasn't, he wasn't at all the shows. He wasn't actually in there, you know, or giving you orders or telling you what to do. He just basically, his orders were take care of my boys. That's all he wanted, his boys look good. Now, uh, you took part in some of the big Parade of Champions shows. There was uh, the one with the two-ring match. Um, it had, like, uh, Steve Williams in it, and then Chris Adams, Gino Hernandez, and, of course, Yvonne Eriks. 
and then of course there was one with the free birds. Um, any memories stand out from those matches? I'll be honest, I, from those matches, I don't really remember that much about. I mean, I remember being in them, but uh, it just wasn't really anything special going on. It's just uh, you go out there, you got your finish, you basically just go out there and just have your match. I mean, it really wasn't that special. Uh, you know, it's just a big time match they tried to put together to, you know, for the show. Yeah, that's all it was. Well, any memories of working with Von Eriks? Yeah, well, all of, I mean, well, uh, Carrie, or well, the, the worst one was the barefoot dude, Kevin. Yeah. He was just crazy. He just, I mean, any of them, they just didn't care about where they hit you or anything. It was just a fight. They just throw punches, and your face was a punching bag. But uh, Carrie was just, you couldn't, don't even set spots. There was no use in it. I mean, and most, most guys work. I mean, we'll do this, we'll do that, whatever, you know. For Devon Eric, you may as well just forget it. Just go out there and be ready for a fight. That's all it was, basically a real honest to goodness fight. Every night when you worked him, I mean, it was a. That's all it was. Kevin hit you with his feet and all that, and just it was a fight. That's all I can say about that. Yeah. And uh, I, I just remember one time I wouldn't work anybody. I was in the dressing room. Kerry was supposed to. Be, it was in uh, Fort Worth, Texas, and he was scheduled to wrestle Ric Flair for the world title. And. Uh, Flair, I guess, was in the ring waiting and waiting and Carrie was back in the dressing room and they were like, Carrie, he's supposed to be in the ring. Oh, huh? he's like, you know, I ain't I don't know if the guy was using chemicals or not. So, I, <laughs> but anyway, he was like all, you know, kind of drowsy. Oh, what? Yeah, he's supposed to. He wouldn't, he didn't have his gear on. So he throwed his trunks on. He put his wrestling boots on and didn't even like, I mean, just, just threw some laces together where they were like, wouldn't even really laced. You know what I'm saying? He went out and worked his little match with Flair, and then later on on TV show, they, Bill Mercer, whoever was doing the announcement at the time, said, you know, well, Kerry Von Erich, uh, he had a fever of 103 degrees or something. <laughs> it was making up some kind of lie for him. That was just pitiful. And then uh, a couple of times, they just, you know, went to West Texas, they just missed flights and wouldn't show up and stuff like that, you know, which I don't know why. I don't, you know, it's not, that wasn't none of my business. You know, but I had a good run with him. You know, me and Playboy Gary Hart. Gary Hart was my manager. I had a good run with him. We did a lot of good business, and they brought in uh, they brought in uh, my partner, Maniac Mark Lewin, and I teamed up. So, Is there any matches or angles that stand out to you from World Class? Or well, I mean, the biggest one ever. I mean, even now, people say, "Man, I remember that." When well, me and Gary Hart did the thing with the claw. They, we challenged Devon Eriks. They couldn't put the claw on my head because it's so big or whatever. And plus, I had the mohawk. I didn't have no hair. You know, and Gary Hart's like, yeah, you can't put the claw on him. So we did the little angle where, you know, we he tried to put the claw on me and all that, of course. And we ended up, you know, ended up into another angle. We just basically put the boots to him, bring the troops in. And but uh, that's what everybody always mentions to me. Yeah, I remember that thing where they tried to put the claw on your head. <laughs> well, what was Gary Hart like to work with? Gary Hart. Uh, I mean, he's just like any other manager, basically, he just wants to take care of business. I mean, basically, any manager wants to take, because the, the, the more main event matches you're in, the more money they're going to make. So, basically, they're trying to keep you in, you know, they're, they're trying to keep you into the top angles, you know, because as a worker, you know, for me, I couldn't go, you know, they didn't want to hear me say, well, hey, man, I got this great angle I could do with Kerry, or I could go to Gary, you know, I could say, Gary, man, why don't we do this with Kerry, or with Von Erickson. Yeah, and he'd go to he'd go to Fritz or whoever was in charge of booking at that time, you know, and tell them, yeah, that's good, you know. But it didn't make sense. I couldn't go tell them that because they're like, oh man, he's trying to run the company or something, you know. But uh, most managers are great, you know. They try to take care of you because you're you're their bread and butter, really, you know. Because if you don't have you or somebody like you, they're not going to be managing. How about uh, the Von Erichs are very well known for their pranks. Any uh, pranks back then or ribs? I never, they never bothered me at all. Yeah. Never. I mean, uh, uh, we just had, like I said, it was a fight every night, and I just, I guess they, I guess they thought I was too serious or something. I don't know. I guess they just didn't want to try me. Yeah. Uh, did, did you did you see any pranks that that stand out to you? Not really. Not with you know, not with them. Yeah. Uh, later in the. WWF, I know some pranks went on then, but not in world class. It was basically just uh, world class for me was basically get to the ring, you know, do do my little fight with them, hope I survive, and you know, make it to the next night, you know. And then again, you go back to Bruiser Brody. That was his home area, was that Texas area. So 
I ended up being there with him also, you know, fighting, doing a big angle with Bruiser Brody for a while there too. How about the Von Erichs outside the ring? What, what, what were they like? Did you ever hang out with them or did you try to stay no, away from them? No, you couldn't. I mean, you know, back mid-south, world-class Florida, it wasn't like you You couldn't hang out with the guys because I'm a heel. They're baby faces. You're too well known. I mean, the TV was like anywhere you went in the Texas area, anywhere in Texas basically, I mean, as soon as you walked out, anybody knew who you were. So you couldn't, you couldn't like hang out with people, you know, same anywhere mid-south, all these all these companies, it's not like it is now, you know, you couldn't do that. I couldn't go and, oh, let's go to the bar and have some drinks, you know, you'd be fired over that. You couldn't do it. Yeah. Heels were with heels, baby faces were baby faces, you know, same with traveling. It's supposed to, you know, everybody's separate. Was there any ever, any rivalries with, like, Brody or Terry Gordy because you were, like, all, you know, the big guys in the territory, anything like that? What do you mean, shoot rivalry? Yeah, yeah. Like no, uh, no not, well, not with me. I mean, to me, it was all just... I was just having a good time out there. I enjoyed entertaining the people, you know, and hopefully, you know, I was hoping I did my best. I mean, and basically for me, that's all it was. I never had any, any trouble with anybody, you know. I almost killed Jim Duggan one time, but that was an accident. I uh, was in Houston, Texas. They had uh, having a tournament for uh, some title or whatever, and I jumped in the ring, I, and I'm like, how can you have this tournament without the one-man gang being here, blah, 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 and Jim Duggan's out there, and so him and I start brawling, and, you know, we go to the floor, he hits me with a chair, and I, same old stuff again, you know, start bleeding, so there's a, the ring post, I take his head to the ring post, like I said before, both of us has vision problems, he's got bad eyes, I got bad eyes, I took his head to the ring post, and on the ring post, the turnbuckle thing goes all the way through on the post. It comes out, the little bolt sticks out the other side like the post is here. The bolt sticks out, which I didn't know. So I posted him and he hit that bolt and the bolt stuck in his head. You know, he had doom, pulled it off. He's bleeding all crazy, you know. So they took him back. They took the cameras back there and filmed it. Of course, they ain't going to let you get away. You know, you shoot an angle. At He's dying, but let's shoot an angle. <laughs> So, that was the uh, UWF title tournament. That right? was UWF. Yeah, he had a big hole in his head, like a big crater from that thing. Yeah. His head swelled up to like two times its size and all that. So. Was he upset about that? With the no, UWF? no, not at all. He was like, yeah. You know, I mean, I apologize. He understood it was an accident, but that really kicked off a feud. You know, I was the, for me, I was one of the biggest. I mean, no matter where I go, everybody's. You know, I remember you feud with Jim Duggan. You know, to me, that's what that's what kicked it off. An accident, we almost killed somebody, but that kicked your feud off with the man. And for years, you know, for that, for years after that, it was me and Jim Duggan, and every kind of match there was, you know, basically. Yeah. And we'll talk about that a little bit more going uh, going back to world class. A couple other guys you had a chance to work with, uh, Iceman, Pink, Iceman King Parsons, and Missing Link. What what were they like to work with? Oh, uh, Iceman, he's all right. I mean, you know, he's got his own little style. Of Missing Link, Missing Link's just because of his, just that gimmick he had, it was hard because he didn't really want to sell anything. You know, he had that missing link kind of, you hit him and he hops around or whatever, and then he grabs his head and headbutts you about knocks you out. Every time he headbutts you, he got his green face on you tights every night, you know. It's just, I mean, not a nice guy, you know, as a person, nice guy. Dewey Robertson, you know, was missing link, you know. So a nice guy personally, but gimmick-wise, just hard to work that gimmick you know you hit him with the chair he can't sell it because he's that's his gimmick is his head if he takes the chair and starts beating himself there's not really much you could do with him so basically i was just a punching bag you know just hit me and i flop around is you know basically all it was how about great kabuki kabuki uh i only had a couple of matches with him but they i mean the matches i had was pretty good he had uh he used some kind of i remember the one match we had in the sportatorium we done a little angle where you got with sunshine or whatever, you know. And so I went to attack him during the match, and he had these, like, spider web things. He threw these things at me, and I got all tangled up in them, you know. And, and basically, you just – you basic Japanese-type wrestling, chop and whatever. He wasn't suplexing. This is more chops and that kind of wrestling. But working-wise, he was great to work with. And after world class, I don't know what happened to that man. Yeah. I heard later he was in Japan, but I never ran into him. Later, you know, when I went to Japan for independent shows or whatever, I never, I never ran into him again after World Class. I don't know what happened. Um, another guy that you briefly crossed paths with was uh, Rick Rude. What, what was Rude like? Rick Rude was a super nice guy, real nice guy. Uh, I mean, like, I didn't like the same thing again. We didn't travel together because we had differing habits, you know. 
each person has their own little habits. Mine's, you know, not the same as other people. But uh, real nice guy. I mean, uh, work-wise, actual in-ring working, I thought he was unbelievable. I mean, really, really unbelievable. I mean, some of the stuff he could do. Uh, I remember, well, I'll say that later, but I had a little story about Rick Root. You go ahead with it now. Well, it was a WWF day. Okay, we can talk right, about it. Anyway, anyway, we'll go back. See, in WWF, we do TVs, and like TV day, you had to be at 10 o'clock in the morning. TV don't start till 7 at night, so you got all day long to kill time. So I started bringing a yo-yo, you know, one of them dunking yo-yos. So every, summer, it just got hooked. Everybody started, you know, wanted to bring yo-yos. We'd see who could do the best trick. So we was trying to see who could get it to spin the longest, you know. I said, you know, I was doing pretty good at it. We was at TV one day, and I'm sitting like, you know, this is the couch here. There's like a little partition right behind me, you know, but you can reach over the partition. I'm sitting there, and here comes this yo-yo in front of me. spins right in front of my face. It's one of these electronic kind. I don't know. It's like a gear kind of thing. It spins and spins and spins. And it's Rick Rude. He goes, hey, how you like that, huh? <laughs> he was like proud of that thing. <laughs> it's a machine. You ain't making it spin. It spins on it all. <laughs> um. Right, back in world class, um, you mentioned before the Von Erichs, they, they would no-show a lot of the house shows and everything. Uh, what, what, what would be like the mood in the locker room when they would no-show? Could you tell that they were kind of killing the territory with all oh, that? It was horrible. It was yeah. horrible mood. Yeah. I mean, uh, you got all these people, you know, uh, of course it was Von Erichs. Everybody was a Von Erich fan. The, fan, the fans were, you know. If they no-showed, you had to substitute somebody. It was god-awful. That's anywhere. I don't care where he's at. You substitute it. It's god-awful. Yeah. You know, I don't care if it was whoever substituted, you know, it was just still horrible. Did Fritz ever, did you ever see Fritz do anything to, to stop that from happening or about Eric's behavior? Never. Okay. Um, now, of course, you know, we know what happened with LeBron Eric's and them com com committing suicide. Well, were you surprised when we kept hearing about suicide after suicide from them? Well, sure, sure I was. I mean, you know, I mean, anybody kills themselves. Yeah. Thinking, man, well, you know, one of them maybe, but then each one after that, one after the other, after the other, after the other. I'm like, my God, what's wrong with this family? Yeah. You know? Do you have any idea why that happened? Did you see any signs of, of I, any of that happening? Well, I know, I mean, I, for, for the older kids, the youngest one, that Chris Von Eric, uh, I just know that, you know, he, he really didn't want to wrestle. He didn't want to be a wrestler, and uh, I don't know if it's because, you know, they had that Von Eric name that kind of forced it on him, you know. He wanted to, he enjoyed music, you know. I know he played a guitar and everything, but they kind of forced that wrestling on him, and I don't know if it had anything to do with it, but, you know, I, I guess that Von Eric name was hard to live up to, you know. You, you, your dad's Fritz Von Eric, and you're, you know, you got to live up to that name. I guess that's, I, I assume that's a hard life to live. When did he end up leaving World Class? Uh, I left World Class basically just to, just like like I said before, it was just time to go. Yeah. It was just time to move on. You know, you kind of you kind of feel you know you've been there long enough, and business ain't really what it should be. So it's just time let's let's get on out of this place. Were there ever any thoughts of going to WWF or NWA at this time, or were you just going back to Watts? I was in Mid South. Yeah. And I kind of felt obligated to Mid South because that's basically really where I first got my, you know, I don't count ICW as my star. Mid-South really where I started getting exposure, you know, for a career. I kind of, you know, I kind of felt it, you know, loyal to them for, you know, so I kept returning to Mid-South. What did you think of when Watts changed Mid-South to UWF and tried to go national with the whole syndicated TV? I thought it was, <clears throat> name change, I didn't, you know, to me, I didn't care about a name change. I just, I thought it was a bad idea to go to national. I just felt, you know, why don't you worry about your own backyard, you know. Who cares if Vince McMahon, you know, is coming to Baton Rouge or Shreveport or whatever. Let him run his show. He's only going to be there one time a year maybe, you know. So, I mean, to me, I, he should have just worried about his own backyard, just stayed the way it was, you know. You, you want to be universal, be universal, but just still be right, you know, locally right there. Once they tried going national, they lost that little local touch, you know. It wasn't like, well, we're going to be in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. It's just too... It was just too big then. Okay. Um, kind of off topic a little bit, but how come you never went to NWA for like a, a long run when NWA was on TBS or anything? Just uh, never, I was like I said, I was always tied up with something else and it just never fit in for whatever reason. I mean, it just never fit in. Okay. Um, what, what was your reaction when you found out that Watts was going to put the UWF title on you? I was in shock. Okay. I was totally surprised. 
they didn't take me in advance and say, you know, we're going to give you the title or anything like that. It was just to show up at TV and this is what we're going to do tonight and you're going to be our champion, you know. I didn't win it. I was given to on a, you know, forfeit, basically. We did the angle where uh, Terry Gordy got his arm smashed in the cage or something. I think he threw the door on his cage and messed his arm up or something. And he came out and couldn't defend the title, so they stripped the title. Him and I were going to work each other for the title. He couldn't defend it. They stripped it off of him and gave it to me on a forfeit, you know. So I didn't really win the title, but still, he was still UWF world champion. So, I mean, I was like totally shocked when I went to TV that day. I'm just thinking I'm going to be another regular old TV day because you don't know in advance until you get there, you don't know what the TV sheet is. You know, you, you know you're at TV, that's all you know. Then when you get there, you find out what's going on, you know. Yeah. I was like, wow, that's great. I'm going to be the world champion. <laughs> <laughs> do you think that was Watts booking still as good as it was the first time you were in Mid South, or do you think he was suffering from any kind of creative burnout or anything? Uh, no, not really. I mean, even UWF. I mean, uh, I think a lot of them angles in UWF years later were some great angles, too. Yeah. With the Fantastics and the Sheep Herders and all them guys, uh, you know, I, thought, I think he did some great stuff. Now, you mentioned, of course, we talked about the Jim Duggan angle already, the famous one. Any memories from your matches with Jim Duggan? Or what, 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 what the program was like against him? How he was to work? How he was outside the ring? Well, I mean, Jim Duggan's basically Jim Duggan. Yeah. I mean, you look at him, he looked like he'd knock your block off, and that's basically what he does. You know, <laughs> you go out there, and it's just like with Devon Eriks, it's pretty much a fight. There's no wrestling to it. I mean, to me, it was, was good for me. You know, I don't have to worry about an arm bar or hip toss or arm drag. It's just basically bare knuckled fist fight is all it was with Duggan and and the people liked him you know and all that and and plus uh you know he had some he had a couple of tragedies in in mid south personal wise you know what I mean yeah. or UWF rather but uh we had we did some great business with him me and uh, the general yeah. um well you mentioned the general Skander Akbar I, I was going to bring him up later what uh, how, how did you like working with Akbar over the years. Well, every time I was in Mid South, he was my manager, and even now, if I go to Texas for an independent show, he manages me even up to this date. Yeah. So I mean, obviously, I mean, if you got that good a repertoire with somebody, you stay with him, you know, for that long, you know. Uh, he's uh, General Skandor Akbar. So <laughs> I mean, was he a cool guy outside the ring? Uh, he had his little quirks, you know. Yeah. I mean, he he had his little ways about him. You know, I roomed with him a few times here and there on the road, and. It wasn't the greatest experience of my life, you know. Nice guy, but I mean, you know, he's just, I guess we were just different age or whatever. You know, I want to stay up and watch a little TV, and he's like grumbling, blah, 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 turn that TV, blah, you know, kind of. I'm like, jeez. <laughs> surgeon, look at these surgeons. <laughs> he'd go in a restaurant, you know, or something, that's what he call. he call all the Mark surgeons. Look at these surgeons. How about Steve Williams? You, you you worked a bunch of matches with him. What was he like to work? He was, uh, when he first came into Mid-South or UWF, he was real hard to work because he's from an amateur background, you know. He had trouble breaking that amateur style, and he was like every night killing you. I mean, you know, just anything you do would hurt you. It didn't matter what he'd do, it hurt you, you know, because he, had a, he was heavy, too. He still had that body weight on. But as years progressed, you know, I mean, he became a great worker. But uh, when, when he first came in, you know, I ended up, having to work him a lot and man it was like pulling teeth yeah. did good. you try to teach him at all or were you just trying to get through no, the matches I, wouldn't. I was just trying to get through the matches you know there's no use trying to teach him you know he was like the Bill Watts kind of baby or I don't know I don't want to use baby but you know what I mean he was yeah. his Bill Watts man you know I, I was just booked with him to get him over that was my sole job I knew that's what it was you book with him you get this man over I don't care how you do it just get him over did you mind being in that position no, I mean, it, at time. I mean, you, you know, at certain times you're like, man, why, you know, why I got to do this? But then you're like, well, you know, heck, it's a payday, and you know, I'm in the main events anyway. You know what I'm saying? I mean, so, I mean, did Watt still have the same philosophy where he's telling you guys to lay it in? And yeah, he's, he always kept that little stiff. You know, always be stiff and protect the kayfabe, and you know, all the all that kind of stuff, and. He got religious later on in life. I mean, from Mid South, he used to cuss up a storm, be cussing and everything. It's TV tapings, and then years later in UWF, he found religion and it pray over the tapes and all kind of you know goofy stuff. You know, God bless the tapes, and uh, it just 
that kind of stuff. So, so lots changed over the years. Then. Yeah, he changed all over you the think years. Think he changed he for the better. I don't, know, I don't know, better wise or whatever. Like I say, he just, it was just different. Okay. Another guy that you worked um, was Ted DiBiase, including DiBiase won a non-title match over you. Any memories of working him? Uh, Ted, Ted DiBiase is. Uh, uh, I mean, it wasn't no special, nothing special to it. I mean, he's just, I mean, just like all these other guys, he was a great talent. That's all I can say, you know. Yeah. I had no trouble with him, you know. Any of these guys you mentioned, you know, for right now, I've had no trouble working any of these guys. Except, like I said, Steve was kind of stiff. But he just didn't know any better. Yeah. How about the Freebirds? What, what, what were they like outside the ring? There's been a lot of wild stories about them. Ooh, <laughs> Freebirds are pretty wild. Uh, any stories come to mind? I mean, none that I was involved personally. I can I can tell stories that, that I know happened. I know one story in particular. Uh, uh, they were going to a show. Buddy Roberts was flying with Bill Watts to a show. Bill Watts used to take an airplane sometimes and fly. And Buddy flew with him this one time. Michael and Terry was driving, so they going and Buddy gave his gear to Michael and Terry. So they're driving down the highway and they see this dead possum or raccoon or whatever on the side of the road, you know, full of maggots and everything. So they, hey, stop, and then, you know, so they pull over this dead animal <laughs> on the side of the road. They pick it up with a stick and put it in Buddy's bag. So they get to the show, you know, and Buddy and him get there and, hey, where's my bag, you know? Oh, here it is. They give him his bag. He unzips it and he got this dead rodent, <laughs> you know, all in his bag. He starts throwing up. <laughs> <laughs> They did that. I know. I know. On several occasions, they'd do the old. Uh, uh, they'd be having like beer in the back, you know, and Terry or Buddy'd be usually on Buddy more than anybody. But Buddy'd be up front, and Michael and him might be in the back drinking beer, and they'd drink the beer, and they'd take a leak in the bottle, you know, and Buddy, hey, give me a beer. <laughs> they'd pass it up, and they, <laughs> and Buddy'd turn the bottle up, you know, and he's like, oh God, you know, and they'd get out and threaten to beat each other up and stuff like that. But I mean, they were they were almost like real brothers, basically. I mean, they were that's how close everybody was. What are your uh, memories of dropping the UWF title to Bubba Rogers? Uh, well, before I dropped the title, uh, before that came about, I'd already talked with Vince about going to WWF. Did Vince contact you, or did he contact? Well, he was trying to contact me. I was on the road with with uh, UWF, you know, working their little shows, and uh, Ernie Ladd is, you know. Was, Kept trying to get in touch with me, and you know he was like, you know, you need to call, you need to call this man. He wants to talk to you about, you know, WWF and whatever. I'm like, ah, it's all right, I'll get around to it. No, you need to. He's really pressuring me, you know. This is, you know, you need to call this man. It's good for your career, you know. It's be a great career move and blah blah blah. And I'm like, all right, I'll get around to it, whatever, you know. I didn't know, you know, Vince McMahon didn't mean nothing to me then, you know what I'm saying? I, I was a UWF champion. <laughs> But uh, finally, this went on for two or three times, and finally, I was in some town, staying over somewhere, working for, working some town, and they finally got, I, they, I got Ernie got in touch with me and said, "Here's the number. You need to call him right now. He wants to talk to you right now." All right, so I didn't have nothing to do, so I just called the number, you know, and got the secretary, and you know, and sure enough, like right away, he switched me over to Vince, you know. Yeah, this is Vince McMahon, you know. <laughs> I'm like, wow, this is, I and mean, he just, you know, well, we'd like you to come, you know, uh, we're interested in possibly you working for WWF and blah, blah, give me the whole spiel and all that. Uh, when's your first day off? And I said, well, I, you know, I think in two more days I got a day off. He said, well, we'll fly you and your wife up to New York, you know, and bring you up to the, up to the uh, building. We'll pick you up in the limousine and bring you up to the offices and we'll talk and all that. I'm sure, that's fine. So this is, you're still holding the belt at this Right, point. I was still champion. So we set all that up, and so I, me and my wife, they gave us first-class tickets, flew us up to New York. You know, I didn't tell anybody this was happening. You know what I'm saying? Nobody yeah. knew. <clears throat> so I went to New York and went in the offices, you know, and, you know, had a meeting with uh, Vince McMahon. And I was, the main thing, I was, uh, Junkyard Dog had already left, and, you know, all J Jim Neidhart, all them guys was kind of moving over there, you know. My main question was, you know, how are the tours like? You know, I mean, where you, how does this work? I don't understand how you do this. So he was explaining all. He explained all that, and he, you know, he's like, give me the, give me the old baloney about, you know, you got a marquee name, and 
you know, Hulk Hogan, he's our champion up here, and we, we always keep big guys for him, you know, we want big guys, and a one-man gang, that's a money-making name right there, we won't change it, we'll use that name. Yeah, right. <laughs> but, <laughs> Anyway, I said, oh, that sounds great. You know, they, did, they didn't really talk money-wise, meaning, you know, exact dollars or no contracts or nothing, you know, was signed or anything. It was just, you know, sure, I'll work for you, no problem. So I went back to UWF and, you know, I went and told them, you know, what I decided to do. At this particular time, Bill Watts was getting ready to sell his company to Crockett's. It was going to go to, to uh, NWA. You know, so it was either, you know, me stay with the NWA, Mid-Atlantic, whatever was going to be, Crockett's, TBS, whatever, or I go to WWF, I picked WWF. Some of the guys stayed there. <clears throat> so it ended up, uh, you know, of course, I knew I was going to have to drop the title to leave. So I called Vince, you know, I said, Vince, you know, what, what do you want me to do with this title? They want me, you know, they want me to drop it right in the middle of Bubba Rogers, who later became Big Boss Man. And Vince said, just do what they want you to do and get out of there. You know, don't cause any trouble. Just drop it. And, you know, ain't no problem with that. I said, all right. So that the was in Muskogee, Oklahoma. Uh, all the, uh, Jim Crockett and all them came to the show. I had to draw. I was scheduled to drop the title. I guess they thought I wasn't going to do it properly. You know, they was all worried about it. They came to me before the show. Everything all right. You know, they all questioned. Everything all right? You you know, uh, yeah, everything's fine. I ain't got no problem with this. You sure? Because they, they thought I was going to screw them over, you know, basically. But I went out there, you know, we did. We had a good match. I thought I had never seen it, but uh, we had a good match. I think I was I was the one that bled and ended up, he beat me right in the middle for the title. That was my last night, you know, and then like two days, three days later, I started in the WWF. What was Bill Watts' reaction when you told him that you were going to WWF? He kind of expected it. I mean, it wasn't no big surprise. I think they kind of knew it. They kind of knew what was going on. And, you know, we would already lost so much talent to them already, you know. Yeah. What were your first impressions of WWF in the locker room? Well, uh, locker room, uh, my f first, well, my first night in a WWF, I didn't even make my show. I missed it. Oh, really? Uh, <laughs> I, they flew me. They was doing TV taping somewhere in Canada. So I'm I'm uh, I'm on the I'm the USA side. I have to get I don't know anything. I, don't, I have to get my own car and everything. And they say just be at this building. I'm like man, I don't know where this place is. I'm driving around. I can't find it for nothing. I missed the show. Really? The flight's late anyway, you know. And then I'm in a rush trying to find this little town up in Canada. There, it wasn't like a major Toronto or you know it was one of them little Kitcheners or one of them little goofy places. So I missed that show, you know. And they're like man, well, you know they're all worried. Well, Make it. So the next night, I think it was in Niagara Falls, which is where I was at anyway. And so I made that show, and they were like, where were you at last night? You know, we was all ready for you and everything. Well, I just couldn't find it. So, so I started that next night, which was all fine and good. So there was no heat on you for missing the first show? No, nah, I wouldn't no heat. Okay. Um, did you have to change your style at all for WWF? No. Uh, they, they wanted that same style, basically, for Hogan. You know, basically, when I first came in, my... My orders were to keep my tights clean. Don't go down for anybody until you get with Hogan. You know, I mean, it didn't matter. You know, every night, don't don't go down. Stay on your feet. That's hard to do, really. You know, you work a whole match and you got to come up with stuff. You know, you stagger or do whatever, but you got to stay on your feet. You know, and until you know, months later, I finally got with Hogan. Then I could open it up a little more. Yeah, they they spent a lot of time building you up for Hogan. Right? Yeah, they spent a lot. Of, I didn't I didn't get a good angle. I didn't get a TV angle. To work with him, they just went off my name, you know, from all them years of TV coverage. Like, uh, big boss man came in, he got a, a big angle where he, you know, they beat him with a nice stick and then I handcuffed him and beat him with a nice stick. I didn't get to do any of that. And we said basically everywhere we went, we set attendance records just, you know, with no angle, just, you know, one man game versus Hulk Hogan. So, I mean, even Montreal, we had to, I don't I guess it still stands, we had the attendance record in Montreal at the forum, you know. Of course, I didn't. You know, I wouldn't give him credit for it, but still, yeah. my name's on the main event. Um, your early matches in WWF were against guys like George Steele and Don Morocco and Ken Patera. Anything stand out from working those guys or those matches? Uh, not really. I mean, it's just, uh, just uh, uh, George Steele was just to me. You know, he's a little stiff, really. And uh, other than that, just they, they just trying to fit into that New York style. Yeah. After coming from from the south, where it's you know really hardcore and 
and you know blood and guts and you know every night and it's just hard it was hard to fit to that new york style i don't know what people understand when i say a new york style yeah but it's just it's just totally different you know it was just more you know real light everybody's just wanted to you know it's just <laughs> i was used to being hardcore basically almost you know like form you know pre ecw hardcore chairs blood every night you know, and then you go to New York, it was nothing like that. Yeah, he actually worked a, uh, a bunch of matches with Jim Duggan. What, what was it like working Jim Duggan in WWF compared to the Mid-South? Just uh, basically in-ring type matches. You wouldn't, you know, we weren't allowed to go outside the ring and move any furniture or anything like that. At that particular time, they kind of, most of the matches were in-ring kind of matches, which, you know, I really didn't like. I like moving around a lot. You know, I wanted to move some furniture, but we weren't allowed to do that. Your, your first big match was uh, Survivor Series 87. It was you, Andre, Bundy, Rick Rude, but Butch Reed against Hogan, Bigelow, Patero, Orndorff, and Morocco. Anything stand out from that match? Well, any, I mean, just to be in the WWE itself was, you know, something big, but actually to make some of these big Survivor Series or any of the big shows, I mean, that's what you, you know, you was hoping to do that. When you get your booking sheet, when you was in the WWF, you look at your booking sheet, you hope you're booked on a card with Hulk Hogan. That's the only way he's going to make money. People think it was all big money. It wasn't all big money. If you was, you know, they had like three crews running at that time because we had a lot of guys. You know, we had three different crews. But the Hogan crew, you know, was the main crew. That's, that's where you made your cash. If you was like in Minot, North Dakota, you know, for, for the week, you might make two grand or something, you know. But you got all your expenses out of that. You got car, hotel. Well, all our stuff wasn't paid for. Like, Nowadays, I, I guess the guys have contracts where a lot of stuff's paid for. You know, we didn't we didn't have that type of stuff. We didn't have guarantee. I don't know Hogan and certain guys may be guaranteed certain things, but us regular workers, we we wouldn't guarantee a certain amount to be paid. It was basically you know buy the house and you know one night I might do great working with Hogan or Savage, and then the next night I might be in an opening match with Hillbilly Jim. You know, and I might make you know 150 dollars or something. You know, it's just that's what people don't understand. They don't, they don't understand that's how it worked. Any uh, memories of uh, WrestleMania 4? You were in the title tournament against Bigelow and Savage. Uh, I was just surprised I actually got to go that far in it. I yeah. figured first round he was going to just beat me and get me out of it. I actually moved on to one of the final rounds. You know, I was honestly surprised by that. How, how did Savage change over the years from the early days in the Papa territory? I don't think he really changed that much, to be honest. Still I mean, crazy. Still crazy. He had the same type of interviews, you know. But, I mean, he was really, really possessive of Miss Elizabeth. I know that, you know. I mean, he really protected her. I remember one time on a f flight, it was full, you know, and it was, uh, you know, Miss Elizabeth was going to be sitting beside some guy, you know, I don't know, just a normal person. And Randy, you know, asked him, hey, could you move? And he asked me what I sat there. So it was Randy, her, and me, you know. So uh, he didn't want to, you know what I'm saying? He didn't trust anybody to be beside of her, you know, except me. He even one of the boys. He didn't trust the boys. Well, I don't know, what What are you going to do on an airplane anyway? Yeah. But that's just the way he was. And the same thing with uh, with uh, when me and the big boss man worked him and uh, Hulk Hogan. I think it was Minneapolis or somewhere. Superpowers, we split them up. That's when they yeah. split up. Same with that. He came to me, you know, they, they wanted to do the thing where uh, – throw him out and something where Miss Elizabeth gets hit or something, you know, or something. He wouldn't trust anybody but me to do it, you know. He said, man, I'm not going to let anybody but you do it. I said, all right, I'll do it, you know. So why do you think he trusted you so much? I, maybe, I guess from the, uh, maybe from the ICW days. I don't know, you know. I, I don't really know. But uh, then years later in WCW, you know, he's, I don't, I don't know what happened then. Why a lot of guys changed later in the WCW days. Yeah, why? Would they, he, he wasn't taking care of you in the WCW days? No, no. Nobody would take care of you on them days. Okay. Hogan didn't speak up for me. Nobody. It just, that, was, that was years later, though. Yeah. Um, in WWF, also, in the early days, you worked a program with Bam Bam Bigelow. How, how was it to work Bigelow? Bigelow's, you know, he's easy to work. I just didn't care to work him, you know. I, I just remember one, you know, I remember one time I it was like he had a hurt leg or arm, something was hurt on him, and they like, you know, uh, you got 30 seconds, put him over in 30 seconds. I'm like, hey, you just get disgusted, like, man, I got to put this dude over in 30 seconds? Yeah. I mean, come on, man. I mean, I've got all these years in the business, you know. 
you, you try not to, you know, you tell people, you don't want to sound like you're big-headed about it. You know, I'm telling Slick, Slick was my manager, you know, I'm like, man, I got to go out there and put this dude over in 30 seconds, you know. So all we did was basically had some in the corner, he moves, I hit the corner, and he rolls me up, one, two, three. I'm like, that's, that's just ridiculous. Yeah. What was Big Little like outside the ring? I didn't really hang out with the man, I'll be honest with you. Uh, I didn't hang out with too many guys at all. Like I said, everybody had their different habits, and I didn't – I didn't want to be around certain things they did, you know, because I, I wanted my job, you know. I, I enjoyed, I, I, I loved wrestling. I didn't want to take any chance on losing my job. Yeah. And you know what I mean by losing it, you know. Yeah. But uh, when I first came into WWF, things were going on in the dressing room. I was like in shock. I was like, golly, I don't know. I'm talking drug wise. Yeah. You know, with top name, top name stars, you know. And I'm sure that. You know, a lot of people know who at that time, you know, you've heard stories, I'm sure. But, I mean, right in the dressing room, too, I'm like, man, this is crazy. You know, I didn't know, I didn't get involved with it. I didn't, I didn't see no sense in it because, like I said, I enjoyed going to the ring. And I don't want to go to the ring messed up. I don't see how, you know, I don't want to travel that way. Matter of fact, Junkyard Dog asked me one time, man, how do you, how do you travel like this without using drugs? I said, I just do it. I enjoy it. That's, this is my job. I enjoy doing this. See how you do that. You know they couldn't understand why I couldn't do that. You know, yeah. so, you know. So I don't see how they could do it. How can you go to the ring and and trust? You know, you you giving your body to somebody and if that person isn't a hundred percent. You know what I'm saying? Because it takes a lot of mental mental capacity to go out there and jump off that top turnbuckle without you know killing somebody. And a lot of these guys are going out there and they wouldn't one hundred percent. I can tell you that. You know, Did you ever have any reservations about getting into the ring with somebody due to like their drug use? No, well the guys I was working with, was, you know, most of the guys were doing it was on the, the heel side, but most of the baby faces, you know, they were pretty straight. The guys that you know I was working with at that time, you know, when I first started coming up, you know, like you said, I was working at Hillbilly Jim and and uh, George Steele and those type guys. Most of them guys, you know, they pretty much took care of themselves pretty good. Yeah, I didn't have much trouble. Did, the, did Vince kind of just turn us back to... At that uh, particular time, I mean, kind of let it go. But then, you know, they I guess a couple of guys got busted here or there, you know. I know one story, everybody knows the Doug and Iron Sheik story, right? Yeah. So, I mean, uh, after a while, when it gets in the newspapers, you know that. Then, he, you know, they come out with a letter about uh, certain buildings are finding syringes from steroid use, you know. Yeah. In, in the dressing rooms, you know, they wouldn't dispose of their syringes and... You know, I, I actually seen guys injecting each other, you know, right in the old dairy air, you know, right in the dressing room, right in front of people. And I'm like, man, how do y'all do that? <laughs> you know, they, everybody's got their little habits. I never had to use them, and I'm, you know, like I said, I was, because I enjoyed the business. I wanted to, I didn't need that. I enjoyed what I was doing for a while. I mean, for a while. And then I started getting burned out. When did you start getting burned out? About third year. Yeah. I mean, we talking, uh, Maybe out of a whole year, we we'll maybe have uh, two or three weeks off, you know. I mean, we were on the move every single day. You're going to the airport in a different city. You might be on the West Coast one day. They fly you all the way back to the East Coast, and you got to work. Then it's back again to the West Coast or whatever. I mean, it was every single day you was on an airplane. I mean, when I was driving in Mid-South, that's fine. I'm comfortable. You know what I'm saying? I'm driving. Man, I'm crushed up on when airplanes we don't get first class tickets we back in the back yeah. on coach you know and I'm 500 pounds and you squashed into a chair for you know three or four hours and it was just horrendous horrendous every day early flights it always get you on the earliest flight possible because you know if there's weather problems or whatever they have time still to get you to the city you know wherever you had to be at and then uh, a lot of times things would happen I'd We'd usually work like three or four week on, then you get a few days off to go home and do laundry, and then bring you back out. Then, like, I know two two different occasions, I was scheduled to be going home like in two days, and they, you know, they call me at the hotel or whatever. Oh, big boss man got hurt. You need to go take his place, you know. So here I am. I'm supposed to be going home, and I, I gotta, I gotta keep going, and you know, keep the tour going. And one time, I think. Uh, uh, Mr. Perfect got in a fight at a bar or something and got hurt. Here I was again, you know, I got to take his place, you know. I'm like, you know, you won't give me the top angles, you know. 
but I got to go take these guys play. I'm good enough for that, but you won't give me the top angles to work with these guys, you know, for the main event money, but I got to go take these guys places. You know, I was kind of getting hot about things like that. You know, me and Slick could talk about it. You know, we tried to have meetings with Vince, and he'd give you the old baloney stuff, you know, about, oh, yeah, we we got you on the back burner right now, but, you know, we're going to get you heated up and all. It never happened, you know. Eventually, I just, they didn't want to fire me. I basically just, they was trying to starve me out, you know. It was like yeah. the payoffs got so bad, you know. By the time I paid my expenses at home and paid my road expenses, I was like paying, you know, extra out of my pocket. You know, it was just ridiculous. So I, I just quit. I was, I don't know, I was booked to go somewhere in uh, North Dakota or somewhere, and I didn't go. You know, I had my tickets and everything, I just didn't go. I told you just them, no show? I didn't go. They called, Pat Patterson calls, uh, Vince wants to know, can he speak with you? I'm like, what well, you got to go through? You got to ask if he can speak with me, you know, and he gets on the phone. George, what's the problem? He never called me gang. George. Uh, what's the problem? And I said, Vin, man, you've been promising this and that, you know, my money, you know, my paychecks are like you signed the things, you know, and I ain't making a living up there. Well, we got you scheduled for blah, blah, blah. You know, you give me the old BS again about we got you coming up. And I said, well, it just ain't working out, Vin. I'm tired. I've been, you know, I've been taking all these guys places. I've been busting my butt for you and it just ain't working out right now. Well, you know, this isn't good business and all that. No, I know it's not good business, Vince, but... You know, a man's got to do what a man's got to do, you know. So, I, basically, that was it, you know. They thought I was going to come back. Even Slick called, man, they, they still talk. They think you're going to come back, you know. And then, like, a week later, they called and said, uh, well, we got this tour going to Japan, you know. We want to know, you know, would you be interested in going to Japan? We'll pay you eight grand or something. I said, no, I don't want to go. I'm burned out. I don't want, I don't want you know, the tour anymore. Uh, you sure, you know, we, we want you back. And I, I don't want to come back. I'm tired of it, you know. It's just too much BS which basically at that time it was. You know, when I first got there, it was great, you know. Was, but then as time wears on, you know, you finally, you wear off that little shine, you know, and you're like, man, this ain't as great as you thought it would be, you know. Yeah. I mean, the money was great. When you worked on Hogan, uh, you couldn't ask for any better money. But I only had like a five-month run with Hogan. I, that whole time I was there, I only worked with him maybe five months, you know. And then after that, you know, DiBiase took over. They did that, you know, DiBiase took the run. You know, and then even uh, uh, with Big Boss Man, when him and I were partners, you know, uh, they switched to Big Boss Man, Babyface. I didn't even get to, I worked him one time at the WrestleMania. He beat me like in five minutes with his sidewalk slam, beat me right in the middle, one, two, three. Here we are, we're, we were partners, and I didn't even get to work an angle with him. You know, they gave the angle to DiBiase again. You know, and I went to Vince, I said, Vince, man, you know, I mean, that would have been a perfect angle, me against Big Boss Man, you know. Yeah, well, you know, sometimes we make bad decisions. I guess this was one of them. And I'm like, well, whatever, you know. No matter what you, he'd listen to you, but he'd always give you the BS, you know. Yeah. Um, I well, you mentioned the Hogan program. Might as well talk about that now. But what, what was Hogan like to work a program? Oh, Hogan to work against was great. I mean, same at New York style, wanted everything real loose. But you knew that was, you know, you had to protect him. This is Hulk Hogan. Yeah. This is the company, basically. So, I mean, you go out there, you really didn't have to do anything. I mean, you just go to the ring. The noise level was so loud at, at that particular time in the, you know, late 80s or whatever. I mean, sold out. Anywhere he appeared was sold out automatically. And the, the level was just so loud, you couldn't even hardly couldn't hear anything, you know what I'm saying? You try to say something in the ring, call a spot, you couldn't do it because the noise, the people were so loud in the buildings. And basically it was just your basic, you know, you get a little heat on him and then he finally, the same old stuff, a couple of blocks, bloom, 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 shoot you in, give you the big foot, and drop the leg, drop on you, one, two, three. But I mean, even, you know, even for that little bitch, you know, sometimes 10 minutes, 15 minutes, you never had to really worry about being last because they never put him last. He was always middle of the card, you know, main event. So, and, uh, but uh, what, what was Hogan like outside the ring? I didn't really outside the ring, I, except for dress room wise, you know, greetings yeah. and all that. Outside the ring, you really didn't see him that much. I mean, you know, he was always kind of protected, you know. He had his limousines and all that, and really didn't really see him too much. How about working with him? Did he always make sure that you got to not been on the match? Or? Oh, he always, he always. I mean, the one thing I, you know, I respected about the guy, he wouldn't come and say, you know, whenever he was working him, you know, you get to finish, you know, the, 
he would, he would come in there with a the finish and go, you know, gang, uh, this is, you know, if it's all right, you know, I need to drop the leg and take the fall. He asked you, is it all right? He wouldn't come in, you know, some, you know, the ultimate warrior, he'd just come in, you know, I'm going to beat you, basically, you know. But Hogan would kind of be a little more diplomatic, you know. Is it all right, you know, is this all right if I do this? And, you know, is it all right if I give you a body slam or whatever, you know. Which to me, it shows a little respect, you know what I'm saying? Some guys, they just wouldn't do that. But with him, he'd always have to make sure everything was all right. And you just go out and you have a, basically, you just have a basic heel match, you know, get his stuff over at the end, and that's all you needed with him. How about Slick as your manager? Did you like working with him? I liked it. I mean, if, at first I was kind of hesitant about it, you know. I didn't, you know, black manager, slick. I didn't know who he was. I, I knew all the big name managers, Bobby Heenan and all them guys. I was like, why couldn't I get one of these guys? Because, you know, they're always going to be in the main events, you know. But as it turned out, you know, slick was, he basically he was my traveling partner for the whole time I was there because our habits were similar. In case people don't know, you know, slick was a minister. He's an ordained minister, and he had a church. He still has his church, you know. I've talked to him, you know, several times. And, but, I mean, we, we had similar habits, you know. We always wanted to make sure we was at the building on time, that kind of, you know what I'm saying, that kind of thing. We Neither one of us smoked, drank, or really, you know, did any partying or anything like that. So, for, you know, riding partner, he was basically my savior in WWF. So I'd been by myself the whole time because I couldn't get along. Me and habit-wise, I get along with guys fine, but habit-wise, there's certain habits, like if I say, hey, we're leaving at 1 o'clock, I don't mean 1.30, I don't mean 2 o'clock, if I, we got to leave at 1 o'clock, I want to leave at 1 o'clock, you know, a lot of guys just can't, you know, you tell them that, and they're still up in their room, you know, watching TV or whatever, you know, and I just, I'm not that way, I'm totally different. If I got to be at the building at 12 noon, I'm at that building usually earlier than that. But some guys just aren't that way, I just couldn't be that way, you know, that's the way, I've always been that way my whole career. What did you think of the idea of teaming up with Big Boss Man? I thought it was uh, kind of strange at first. You know, he had this southern little uh, Big Boss Man gimmick uh, from Georgia, and here, you know, Slick was the black guy. I guess at first I thought it was strange, but then it really clicked. Except he was, you know, in the ring, he's kind of clumsy. Uh, I remember one one time in particular, he's always hurting Slick. Or something, I don't know, he'd always run into him, do whatever, but he's always hurting somebody because he was just clumsy, not meaning to be, but he's just that way. Uh, and uh, the same match we talked about earlier were with the superpowers, uh, mega powers, whatever they were, Hogan and Savage, it was me and Boss Man teamed up against them on that uh, Saturday night main event or whatever it was called back then. But uh, we both, was, we had, I think it was Savage was on the ropes and we both went to hit the ropes at the same time, but Boss Man was like a split second ahead of me and took the rope away from me and I tumbled out on my head. I mean, I just didn't, I didn't hit anything. I just went straight out on top of my head and like everybody run over, man. Slick was over, you all right? You know, it's live TV. You can't, I mean, there's no, you can't stop the tape. This is live, you know. I'm like, hey, you all right? Yeah. And then, you know, like I said, I worked at one, I only really worked one match with Boss Man at that pay-per-view. Uh, I think it was, uh, I'm not sure which one it was, but one of them I worked against Big Boss Man. He gave, me a, six. he gave me the sidewalk slam to pin me and cracked one of my ribs, yeah. you know, and I'm like, man, man, this dude was like, he was a, I mean, great gimmick and everything, super nice person, just a walking disaster area. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> what are your uh, memories? You did a bunch of tag matches against Savage and Hogan. What, any memories stand out from those? Uh, just, like I said earlier, it's just so easy. You don't have to really do anything. The hardest thing, uh, as long as Hogan was in it, it was easy. But if you had ended up with Savage by itself, it was like, you know, the speed of the match was 100 miles an hour. I mean, I couldn't keep up with him because he was like, you do anything, he's like to the top turnbuckle, jumping off with a double axe handle. I mean, no matter, he just wouldn't slow down. He was just so fast at everything, you know. I mean, I was like, slow down, let me take a breath, you know, something. He, he just wouldn't slow down. That was the hardest thing. I had to work him. We went to France for a tour. Where I flew, he flew on the Concorde. We flew all us. The regular crew flew on jets over to Paris. First night in, we get into that morning. We got to work that night. We're all jet lagged. I get to the building. I find out I'm working Savage. Yeah. You know, he's the world champion. I got to work Savage. So we had just like a 30 minute match. They go, oh man, time's short. Y'all got to really put some time in. I'm like, oh man. 
man, I blew up so big, I was like about to, I mean, I come out of the ring almost throwing up, you know what I mean? Because he wouldn't slow down. He was like 100 miles an hour. And I was, you know, I don't, usually don't get hot, but man, I come back hot and I'm like, man, if won't they get somebody who can do this? Here I am, 500 pounds. I can't, you know, I can't keep up this kind of speed in the ring. I cannot do it. You know, I'm, I'm kicking over garbage cans and whatever. Usually I'm pretty cool, you know, but man, I, I was pretty hot about that because they got to do 30 minutes with a macho man, you know. That's not my style. That's Ricky Steamboat or, you know, somebody of that caliber. I, that's not for me. You know, I was like dying that night. Jet lagged, the hot building, you know. I'm like, yeah. But that was the hardest. Working Savage was hard in that aspect, just meaning couldn't keep up with um, you also had some matches against the Rockers, especially uh, WrestleMania Five with uh, Marty Jannetty and Shawn Michaels. Yeah, I get I get quite a few comments on that clothesline I gave him. Uh, uh, <laughs> but uh, even before that, years before that, I met Shawn Michaels, uh, San Antonio. I was working uh, uh, in out of the Texas group over there, and I ended up uh, Shawn Michaels was just a I don't know 18 year old kid or something, and came in just for TV. I squashed him and like three minutes who would think you know years later what he would become right but uh the, the match you're talking about there the rockers i watched it back and you know i watch it back now i'm thinking man we should have you know why didn't we set up some more spots because they're great guys you know all they could do anything you wanted to do and i, I watched the match and i'm thinking we should have done more you know spots with them or something than what we did but then you know when you go out to the ring you go out to the ring and they might tell you you got five minutes you know, they give you, you know, for matches, you got to set time usually, but sometimes the time does don't work right. You know, you might they may tell you early in the day, all right, the whole match, including the entrance, might be 10 minutes. Then we're, you know, we're heading out to curtain to go to the ring. Oh, time's running over. you got five minutes. So you might have set, you know, five different spots with them. Now you got to, you know, condense everything. And sometimes it just don't work right. Yeah. Was there anything about that clothesline? Or was it no, no. It was, that's what I'm saying. It looked like I killed the guy, but, I mean, that's what I mean by – you know, how good a worker, you know, it looks like I took the dude's head off. You know, everybody says, man, what a clothesline. <laughs> you know, but it's just, that's how, he's just, that's how good a worker he is. How well was Sean, like, outside the ring? At that particular time, you know, he was, uh, he was a great, you know, both of them were nice guys, you know. I didn't have, but then years later, when I went back to WWF, years later after I left, they brought me back in, you know, for a TV tryout, as they say which was ridiculous. Here I was, you know, all them years I'd work WrestleMania, SummerSlam, Survivor Series, and everywhere. And here I am, I, you know, they want to bring me in for a TV tryout. I'm like, these, these people's too much. But anyway, I went up there then, and he was kind of totally, like, different. You know what I'm saying? He just wouldn't, he was kind of, I don't know, I don't want to say egotistical or anything, but he just, I, I guess he felt, you know, he, I don't know. He just wouldn't, you know, he wasn't the same type kid from years past. You know what I'm saying? But he didn't have that you know, niceness about him anymore. Yeah. Um, you also had a chance to work Andre the Giant again, or you actually tagged with him at a summer I tagged slam. with him, you yeah. know, several times. I have worked against him as, as a baby. I mean, it was the heel. He was a baby face earlier in my career. Then when he was up there, we tagged together. What was it like tagging with him? Uh, basically, at that particular time, he pretty much protected Andre. You know, he was pretty much health-wise, it wasn't the greatest. So, I mean, basically keep him on the outside and just let him, you know, every once in a while come in to make an appearance was basically our given orders. Because, you know, you just really couldn't really do too much at that particular time in his career. Okay. Any uh, memories stand out from the Royal Rumbles that you were in? Uh, not really. I remember, I, mean, I know the first Royal Rumble we did, I think it was telecast live or something. And yeah. the last two in the ring was me and Jim Duggan. I remember that. I remember the uh, finish was, you know, I charged him. He pulled the top rope. I tumbled over the top rope. And then from then on, that's when they started the little uh, Royal Rumble you know, pay-per-view type whatever thing. So that was the, at that time, I mean, they didn't have a pay-per-view every month. You only had certain one, you know, and you, you pray, please, I hope I'm on WrestleMania because you may not be on it, you know. You weren't always in it. Or you may be on Survivor Series, you know. You was hoping to because that was where your big money would come from. You're getting good payoffs. But, you know, a lot of times you wouldn't make it. There was quite a few summer slams. I didn't make it or whatever, you know. I'm like, man, what is this about? You kind of, you didn't understand it, you know. You can't go to the man and say, man, you need to put me on these shows or whatever. You just couldn't do it. It just got ridiculous after a while. I mean, it, it just got so bad that, you know, they had us doing just stupid stuff. I remember one time we was up in this little town in Michigan, 
Frankenmuth, Michigan, or somewhere up there. And uh, we had a food fight on TV. They put us in these goofy suits. I don't know, like cl uh, mountain climber, you know, whatever. It was Oktoberfest. And we had ended up having a big, huge food fight. And I'm like, man, this is like, me and Slick was just sick over it. It's like stupid, you know? What, what is that going to do? I didn't understand, you know? What, what is this? We're having a food fight. What's it going to do? I didn't understand it. It wasn't me to understand, though, was it? Now, uh, something a lot of people are waiting to hear about is uh, the whole idea behind the Akeem gimmick. What a little job. <laughs> well, how did they approach you with the gimmick, and like, who came up with it? I assume it was uh, the idea to come up with it, I assume, was Vince McMahon. Yeah. The uh, basic uh, basic thing of it was uh, I was, was doing TV tapings wherever it was at. I don't even know what town we was in, but... Uh, uh, Vince approached me and said, do you know how to dance? And I'm like, I didn't understand. What is he talking? You know, I said, no, not really. He said, well, you need to learn. And that's all he told me. You know, you need to learn how to dance. And I'm like, well, I didn't understand. So Slick took me to the side and said, you know what they're going to do? No, I ain't heard a word about it. Well, they're going to make you a black man. I said, they're going to what? Yeah, we, they, they're going to make you a black man. You know, and, I, and he kind of gave me an idea what it was going to be. And I said, no, nah, I thought he was joking. You know, I thought he was ripping me. No, nah, it ain't you ribbing me. Sure enough, they come up, you know, you know, uh, Vince took me in his little office there at TVs and said, you know, gang, you know, the one-man gang, he's he's kind of dull. He don't have any color. You know, he got that black outfit and all that. He just ain't got no color. We need a character now. We need somebody that's got some flash and color to him. We're gonna, we got this idea to make you a black man, you know. We're going to give you this yellow outfit and whatever, and we're going to call you Akeem from Deepest Darkest Africa. I'm like, yeah? And I'm like, wow. I was in shock. <laughs> all my life I've been one-man gang almost, now I'm going to be Akeem, the African dream. So they, they, you know, they, I said, well, sure. Basically it was, you know, we got a spot for Akeem, but we don't have a spot for one-man gang anymore. So what are you going to say? Hey, I guess I'm going to be Akeem. So they sent me up to New York and had me fitted, and, you know, they made the outfits for me, how they wanted that goofy, big old tall hat everybody used to call a chef's hat and uh so they we went to tv my first night is Hakeem you know they said well just you know go out there and I, I had no idea how to do it I slick had been trying to you know give me some little movements and whatever and all that and I was scared to death and usually I'm not you know I've never been nervous but that one night I was really nervous because it's a totally new character you know what I'm saying it either works or you're unemployed you know, so I went out and me and Slick were there, a little move out to the ring and all that. And, uh, I basically, I just played a fool. You know, I'm like a white man trying to be black, knowing I can't dance, but I'm up there trying to dance and all that. And basically, I mean, luckily it clicked. People were kind of, you know, got with it. But they didn't switch me as a baby face with it. They kept me as a heel. And me and Slick, you know, we talked it over and said, man, that's where they're making a mistake. This is a, you could really do some business as a baby face with this, you know, because I'd get down in the guy's face and, Act like I'm, you know, cutting wind in his face and all kind of junk like that. And, and they loved it. When I came back after the little TV match, you know, they was clapping. Everybody gave me a standing ovation. So I knew right then it was pretty safe, you know. Yeah. Who, what, the locker room gave you the standing ovation? Yeah. Everybody. Vince was back there, you know. The T, all the agents was back there and all the workers, you know, because we all sat back and watched monitors, you know. Everybody stood up, yeah, man, that was great, you know. Just And all I did was just act like a fool. From then on, I knew how to do it, you know. Just go out there and act stupid as you can act. Did, did Ben say anything after? Did he take you aside and say that was great? Or Yeah, he did. He shook my hand, you know. He said that was great. He just basically just shook my hand and said, you know. Yeah. And then from then on, it was just, you know, Akeem, the African dream, you know, and all that stupid, you know, hey, blah, blah, and all that. I mean, here I went from a... You know, the one man gang killing everybody to this, you know. And it's, yeah. Did you, were there any parts of the gimmick that you enjoyed doing? I enjoyed the gimmick. Oh, okay. It was great just to try to do something different, you know. That was mainly the, at first I didn't, I thought, man, this is crazy. This is insane. But then, you know, once I actually got the outfit on and I said, man, this, this may not be too bad, you know, just to be different. You know what I'm saying? It's yeah. Actually a challenge to, to do, be a different character. You know, they did why they said to grow my hair out, so I grew my hair back out. I lost a mohawk and all that. Yeah, that was. Uh, yeah, I didn't. I didn't hate the, the gimmick at all. So, so you ended up having fun with it then. I had fun with it, and, and 
you know, and even now, you know, I'll go to s certain places and people yell out, hey, Akeem, give us a dance, you know, yeah. and things like that. So that shows you how strong the TV is, you know. All them years, people still, you know, Akeem, Akeem. <laughs> <laughs> Do you, uh, would you rather be remembered for one man gang rather than Akeem? Or oh, of remember? course. Well, yeah. I mean, I, I was both, but I mean, you know, one man gang is like, you know, as, as me, basically, Akeem was just a little sideline, little. It was basically a character he could trademark, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. He didn't have the trademark on One Man Gang. He wants a character that he can trademark. This is my character, you know. I invented his character. That was his big thing, you know. So, Akeem was his character, so. Yeah. Were there any vignettes that you did or promos or anything as Akeem that really stand out to you or that you really enjoyed? Well, we did that first one. They first introduced me. They took me somewhere up in Connecticut in the middle of the night, 2 o'clock in the morning. Uh, they had this big old burning garbage can flame shooting out of it and Gene Oakland and all that's out there talking and whatever. I don't know. He's he's doing the old scared bit. I don't know what we're doing out here and whatever, you know. And then here comes Slick walking in, you know, with the big boom box. Hey, but I was going la, 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 la. And then all this this big explosion happens and I come up from behind the explosion as Akeem, you know, no longer the one-man gang. He explains. He found his roots. You know, he's now Akeem, the African Dream, and they had these African dancers all dancing around, you know. Akeem, Akeem. <laughs> so that was a pretty good video. <laughs> we did that one. We did uh, we did one in the zoo one time. We, had, we was doing wherever we was doing the TV from. We went to the zoo. We did that at the zoo. Uh, it was just, I was like in the bush. <laughs> like hiding in the bush, deep as dark as Africa. And it was, you know, I was cutting the interview, and me and Slick was in these bushes. Did that, and then we had uh, we went on Arsenio Hall with it. That was pretty fun. Not really? Yeah, me and Big Boss Man Slick got to do Arsenio Hall show. That was a pretty good time with him, you know, just to be able to open up the character, you know, because I went out, you know, I grabbed his hand and done all that Soul Brother stuff, you know, and he said, hey, he just shook my hand about 20 different ways. What is it with this man? <laughs> <laughs> so that was, that was a good time. So, I mean, he got to, you know, he got to do fun stuff with it. More than he would, I guess, as a one man gang, you know. Yeah. And if I was, you know, what I don't understand, if I wasn't colorful, give me an outfit that I could still be the one man gang and just add some, you know, put some color to it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. When they first gave you the gimmick before you went out there and started doing it, did you think that they had any chance of getting over the way that they never, did? Never, never. Yeah. I thought that was, yeah, I thought that was the end of my career. <laughs> to be honest, I thought this is, you know, this is the worst thing I ever heard. But then after. You got to take it, you know what I'm saying? You got to take it and do the best you can with it. And then after you did the first stop, you saw that it had a chance of getting more. Had a chance. I mean, it, I, I, I never really, I don't think I really got any great big main events out of that. But, I mean, it, the people enjoyed it, I think, you know. I mean, I watch it back now, it's just embarrassing to watch. I, I'm like, man, I can't watch that. Turn <laughs> change it. Get that off of there. I hate that. I mean, I, I enjoy doing it, but I hate watching it now. It's like yeah. crazy. What, um, now you mentioned you left WWF. Did you have any kind of plan on what you were going to do when you left WWF? I had no plan at all. Okay. I had, all I wanted to do was just get out of, you know, just take a break and relax. Cause man, I was beat up and tired from traveling every day. And basically the first year I was out, I just, I didn't do anything. I stayed at the house and just rested, you know, stayed with my family. Cause I, three or four years, I, I hadn't seen my family in almost four years, you know, from traveling. Yeah. So I just wanted to stay with my family. And then he ended up in WCW. How did that come about? Yeah, they, they uh, called me up to go. Dusty called me up and wanted me to come into WCW. So I went there and ended up working a little, uh, you know, ended up with Kevin Sullivan down there and working with that uh, El Gigante. You know, How was he to work? Uh, hard, very hard. He, he didn't know he didn't know anything about wrestling and. Just clumsy, big, tall guy, just clumsy as could be, and just every night was just a struggle with him. But uh, the gimmick itself, you know, with Sullivan was all right, I guess. Yeah. I mean, we did that old satanic type gimmick, you know. He paint my eyes all black looking, spiked my hair up, and put me in a straight jacket and tote me around and stuff like that. That was all right. But actual work wise, I didn't. So, I don't know. I just didn't fit in with the guys. I don't. I don't know where he was with WCW and all that. Like, Lex Luger and all them guys, uh, I just didn't click with them guys. Yeah, probably the best known match is he did a stretcher match. It was Luger and Elegante against you and Ric Flair. Any memories from that match? I just remember I'm the one that got stretchered out. That's what I remember. <laughs> That's the main, 
You know, so we're none of them guys. Who got stretchered out? The one man gang got stretchered out. <laughs> That's what I remember. <laughs> what was it like teaming with Flair? Uh, Flair was, was great to team with. I mean, it's Nature Boy Ric Flair. Yeah. You know, one time we was in uh, some place uh, out west somewhere, and him and I were teaming up against somebody, and actually to, had a riot in the building. The building started rioting, you know, and Flair was like, oh, one of them nights where he's just, you know, having a good time, you know, it wasn't a huge coliseum, it was a smaller type, you know, setting, and he was just having a good time. People was starting to riot, throwing stuff in the ring, and he's strutting, woo, woo, he was having a good old time, you know what I'm saying? Hey, gang, we're having us a riot, woo! <laughs> he was having a good time. <laughs> You know, it's fun to see people that just enjoy things. You know, after all them years, you still have a good time at it, you know. It wouldn't like really working. You just... Yeah. Most player like outside the ring? Oh, super guy. Yeah. But to me, I mean, I I mean, to me, a super guy. I remember I was in WWF, and we was in Nashville, and Flair came in with his son one night, and his son wanted to get my autograph. I'm like, man, this is Ric Flair, and his son's wanting my autograph. You know, I mean, it's like, I don't seem right. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, he was... I mean, to me, one of the nicest guys you want to meet, business-wise or personal, you know, just super. When you were in WCW in, in 1991, what was the locker room like compared to the WWF locker room? Oh, it was horrible. It was it? It was god-awful to be in there. Why is that? Uh, well, you talking about the, just the Bischoff time? Or no, the 91. 1991. Oh, the 91? Yeah. Oh, they were just trying to survive, basically. Okay. I mean, business wasn't that great at that time. You know, and like I said, I was just in there to work that giant which was pulling teeth every night. And, you know, it was just, they were just trying to survive. And then they put me with uh, PN News, yeah. working him. That was another, you know, just pulling teeth and tight match. And ended up we're having these splash matches where, you know, to win the match, you got to splash the guy. So uh, the end of my career happened there was uh, uh, him and I are supposed working somewhere and, and uh, they sent word for him, you know, he's going to go over me, you know, with a splash. You know, and I'm like, I don't understand this, you know. I, I didn't I didn't understand why he putting him over. And they said, well, that's just the orders we got. I said, well, why can't we do, you know, something else? You know, no, nah, they want him to catch you with a splash. And I said, well, that's my finish, but, you know, he's going to splash me and pin me? Yeah, that's what they want. I said, well, I'm not going to do it, you know. I was stupid. I'm not going to do it. You try to stand, you know, you see these other guys stand up for motors, and they get away with you know, Sting and all these guys, they get away with anything. Yeah. First night I tried to do it, I get fired. <laughs> that was it. I went home, they, they said, we're well, going home. And Dusty said, go home and we'll, you know, think it over, take a little break and we'll give you a call. They called me back and said, well, if you come back on TV uh, and uh, put him over on national TV, you know, you got your job back, no questions asked. And I said, no, nah, that's all right. I don't, I don't think I want to do that. Who was the one that was calling you? Who was calling the yeah. finishes? Dusty. Dusty, okay. Yeah. yeah. See, they'd already told me, which I'm kind of glad I left anyway. They'd already told me in advance they was going to do this gimmick. It was coming up on Halloween Havoc. And uh, I was going to be in the Halloween Havoc main event. It was some kind of electrified steel cage, some kind of gimmick. I don't know. But anyway, it was going to be uh, during the match, something happens, the lights go off. And when they come back on after the match, I was going to be like laid in the middle of the ring, you know. And, and uh, on the way out, I was going to be like totally out of my mind. And, you know, I'm asking, did you see the light? And that's the whole thing. Did you see it? Did you see it? And whatever, some kind of gimmick like that. And come to find out, they just wanted me to turn into a preacher. They had some kind of god awful Amish name, you know, some preacher name. They said, we're going to try this and really, we believe it'll work, you know. And I said, oh, man, whatever. So they was going to, they was going to take me downtown Atlanta and have me preaching on the corner, you know, and film it and all that. And it was going to use a book similar. They didn't say Bible, but it was going to be some kind of something similar to that, you know. And it was going to dig out the inside and put knuckles in it, you know. And during my match, I'm working, and you know, and then I take the gimmick and knock the dude out, you know. I got the Bible, and the, the whole gimmick would be, you know, did you see the light? I saw the light, and all, you know, and all this. It, was, it would have been god awful. I know it would have been. But uh, anyway, like I said, I quit before that anyway. <laughs> Did you have any plan then? then I they think quit? they substituted Abdullah the Butcher yep. for me. Yeah, yeah, they did. But they didn't do the whole preacher gimmick. Yeah. Did, um, when you left WCW at that point, did you have any kind of plan? Because then it was a couple no. of years before. I just went, I just went, you know, I kind of just got out of business, you know, basically did some just independent, local independent stuff and stayed low, basically. Most people, I think a lot of people just thought I died or whatever. Because, yeah. you know, I mean, I wasn't heard of for a couple of years. 
Yeah, and then you went back to WCW yeah. in '95. Uh, Jimmy Hart and uh, Jimmy Hart and Kevin Sullivan again called me up. Hey, uh, you know we we got a job here. Are you interested in coming back in? You know, blah blah blah. Yeah, why not? So I went back in. Uh, went back in for them and and uh, this was during Eric Bischoff time. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm at the airport. Like a connecting flight, I come from Baton Rouge to Atlanta, and then they're going from Atlanta. Most of the guys lived in Atlanta, so I, I'm in Atlanta getting on a flight, going to wherever they're going for TV, and Eric Bischoff's checking in at the same counter. He looks up and goes, one-man gang? Yeah, what are you doing here? I'm going to this town. Well, what do you mean? I said, I work, work for you. You work for us? He didn't have no idea I worked for him. I mean, can you believe that? He had no idea I worked for him. <laughs> So anyway, uh, we went to Nashville or somewhere, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't schedule on the card, and uh, so it was like a dark match. But they filmed it. I beat the Japanese guy for the U.S. title that night, which he didn't want to. You could tell he didn't want to drop it, you know. But anyway, I beat him, and I was the U.S. champion for a short while. Then, that was uh, the uh, Kansuki Sasaki. Yeah. Where didn't they they stop tape after you beat him and then they started rolling again and, and rolling tape again and you went over on him or yeah. he went up back over on you right, exactly. but they didn't acknowledge it was that just the way to get the title off him right okay he, he didn't want to drop it so that's you know, he got it they come up with that I was just a they just gave me the title as a stepping stone for Conan they needed you know you know I'm a good white guy I hate to say that you know it's true though you know I'm a good white guy and you know we got Conan and we we're gonna have to put the title on him eventually. So you know, I, me and Conan's style didn't fit at all because yeah. he's that high. You know, he's got that Mexican lucha style. You know, them flips and all that. That didn't fit me at all. You know, so I just basically we done some stupid finish on the Monday show where he just pinned me. Basically, you know, it was just nothing. But uh, I knew that's what it was about. You know. So it's you weren't right. surprised that you only had the belt for a month. It didn't bother me. It was fine. I got to take my pictures with it and all that. I was happy. But. Uh, but then, uh, you know, I worked Hogan on the, the Vegas. We was in Las Vegas. It was, I got to work Hulk Hogan on the Monday show. Of course, I, you know, I was putting him over. I knew that. <clears throat> so this whole time I was in WCW, you know, uh, Terry Taylor told me, man, you need to go talk to Bischoff about a contract. I wasn't on a contract. Just about everybody there was on contract. You know, they was making some big-time money, too, for doing nothing, you know. And... Uh, and you'd go in the dressing room, you'd hear them talking about it, too, you know, about their contracts and this and that. And here I am, I'm making like, I don't know, $500 a show, basically, is what I was making. But I, I wasn't working that much, because I wasn't getting, you know, I was only working a couple times a week. So I, Terry Taylor said, you know, you need to talk to Bischoff about a contract. Yeah, yeah, go talk with him. All right. So I was in Las Vegas, you know, and after the Hulk Hogan match, I mean, I did all I could. I put the man over right in the middle, didn't say nothing about it. So uh, Bischoff was in a trailer, you know, I went in, went in his trailer talking with him, you know, and, and basically I just, you know, I said, uh, you know, I'm, I'd just like to talk to you about a contract. And he got all crazy, man. He bowed up on me like, we don't do business like that here. Really? I said, what do you, what do you mean you don't do business like that here? You, all you guys are on contracts. All I'm asking is for, you know, I, I want a contract so I can have some, you know, for my family. I want, I want to be taken care of like everybody else. I, just, I told the man straight up, I said, you got guys that can't even lace their boots up on $100,000 contracts, and you can't give me a contract, you know? And he, well, oh, I got to talk this over with Kevin Sullivan, real, you know, really assy about it, you know, and I'll get back to you, you know, like that. I guess he thought I was going to jump on him or something, you know? I was just trying to be business. Legally, you know, I said, I just went out here and put Hulk Hogan over. I had never said anything about you asked me to do. I've always done it. I'm just asking for, you know, for this, you know, give me a contract. So as it happened, you know, I went home. They usually send you a booking sheet out. I never got a booking sheet. You know, they was coming to Baton Rouge for a show. I wasn't on the show, you know, no more. They never fired me. They never called and said, we don't, we don't want to use you or anything. They just never booked me anymore. So basically, you know, you know you're fired. <laughs> yeah, that was my big adventure with Eric Bischoff. <laughs> but what was the uh, politics like in the locker room at that time? Everybody was out for themselves. Yeah. I mean, whoever could get the biggest contract. That's all they was concerned about. It wasn't no friendships. It wasn't, you know, nobody was going to help anybody. It was each man for themselves, you know. I mean, was, like I said, Hogan didn't speak up for me. Uh, no, nobody spoke up for me, you know. I mean, 
I know good and well Hogan could have went in there and told that man, you know, hey, you know, he's a, he's a heck of a hand. Keep him around, you know. Give him a hundred thousand a year. I wouldn't ask him, you know, for them big time five hundred thousand a year contracts like uh, Nash and them other guys had. I was just, you know, give me a hundred grand a year. I've been happy. You know, that's all he had to do. If he had just said that one word, he would have got. You know, you know, you know, good and well they would have given it to me. He wouldn't speak up. I didn't, I, you know, I didn't understand that. After all him, you know, WWF and all that time taking care of him, and he wouldn't do it. When you work with Hogan again in '95, was he the still, still, uh, what, still the same way about? Uh, is it okay if I drop the leg? Is it okay if I body slam him? Uh, he didn't. I mean, he didn't really. I mean, he. he he met me and greeted me after all them years, you know, still was pretty nice, but just, it was more just business, you know, let's just get in here and I'm going to drop the leg and let's go about our business, you know, that's the way everybody seemed to be. Just like I said, it was just everybody from themselves, it seemed like, you know, as long as they had those big time contracts, that's all they cared about. Yeah. Business-wise, they didn't, you know, actual in the ring stuff, they didn't care, you know, just... How about guys like uh, a guy like Sting? We haven't talked about. He was there, and he was also there early in your career in UWF. Did how, how did he treat you? Did he change throughout the years? Just, uh, I mean, you'd meet the man. He just basically is a meet and greet and move on. They wouldn't know, you know, sit down and ask you, you know, how's your family, how's this or that. It just basically, you know, they acknowledge you and I acknowledge them, and you just go about your business. It wouldn't like you know no big hugging scene or anything like you know long lost brother or something like that. Yeah. Everybody was just in it for business, you know, all they wanted was that money. Any uh, memories of working that three ring uh, battle royal where they had like a hundred guys in it or anything? I just remember I was another one. I was in shock when they told me I was going to be the last man in it. You know, one of the, I was right down to the last three, I think it was. Yeah. And then it was, they were worried that I was going to screw them over, you know. You, you know, Hogan and all of them was coming to me. You, you're going to go over, right? You're going to go over the top rope and all that, you know, because they thought I was going to mess them over, right? What good is that going to do me? I'm like, sure, I'm going to be all right. So basically, that was it. They was just, all of them was just worried that I wouldn't do my job like I was supposed to do it, which, of course, I'm going to do it. I ain't going to, you know, because I respect the business. You know, it's pay-per-view. I know that. And I want to, I mean, you tell me to go out first. I go out first. I don't, you know, this is my business. I love this business. And I, they, I, I didn't understand why they were so worried about me screwing them over, you know. Then um, after WCW, did you mainly just work indies? I think you did like a couple of shots in Japan. And yeah, stuff. just uh, after WCW, I was pretty much disgusted with everything, and I just went to Independence, you know, local Louisiana, wherever Texas, wherever Independence, and did a little Independent in Japan a little bit. You know, just, did you still love the business at all, or were you just I enjoy. I I like the business itself. I, I I love getting in the ring and you know having a great match. You know, you have a good match, you entertain the people and just have a good time with it. I just hate all the, you know, I just couldn't deal with all the politics and everything behind the scene, you know, of, of having to, you know, fight to try to get a contract or this and that. Independence, you make your deal for your money. You go there, work, you know, usually you're the biggest name on the card, you know, you, you make your deal for your money, which is, even on Independence at times I have showed up, you know, oh man, the house, we just ain't got no money, you know. But uh, majority of the time they're there with the cash, and you just ain't got that hassle. You know, you just ain't no hassle about it. Now you uh, eventually ended up in ECW too for uh, a yeah, stint there. Yeah, the beautiful ECW. Yeah, how'd that come about? Uh, well, I knew uh, Fonzie uh, from Florida days. He used to be our referee in Florida. Bill Alfonso. Bill Alfonso. I call him Fonzie. Yeah. Uh, he came. I knew the I'd, the ECW show played in Baton Rouge. I, watch it at night and whatever and I seen him advertise coming to town so I said man I'm gonna look Fonzie up and try to get in touch with him so I got in touch with him he was doing a show in Alexandria I just went as his guest to watch the show you know because I I wanted to just go watch it I wasn't really planning on you know working or doing anything like that I went and watched the show and you know I met all the guys which all the guys were super guys you know it was like you know I've been watching all these years you know the basic basic spiel you get from everybody which is great and then, you know, Paul Lee, who I'd known for years, you know, from managing and stuff like that, <clears throat> he just uh, asked me what I'd be interested in, you know. And they had Spike Dudley there. I guess he was beating all the big guys, you know. He asked me what I'd be interested in putting him over, you know. I said, yeah, why not? So I, I said, why not? It's payday. What the heck? Yeah. You know, so he said, well, you know, what's it worth to, you know, what's it going to cost you? I said, well, you just... 
you just figure that out, whatever you pay me. You know, I, I don't like giving, you know, I don't want to go to the guy and say, what's going to cost you X amount of dollars? I just told Paulie, I said, Paulie, you pay me whatever you think's fair. So I went out, I, you know, went out and did the little gimmick. He gives me the little Spike Dudley, whatever they call it, acid drop and all that. I put him over. And so he came and paid me. He gave me 500 you know. And then he said, would you be interested in working, you know, for the company? I said, sure, you know. And he said, well, I'll pay you 500 a show. I said, hey, that's all right with me, yeah. you know. I've been sitting at the house. So basically it was just uh, I didn't really do too much on the TVs. It was kind of more I do house shows and actual TV work. I didn't do too much for them. You know, I remember the pay-per-view we had in Orlando, me and Rod Price. I think we worked the uh, microphone match where they had to get the microphones adjusted before the show. I'm like, I told, <laughs> uh, I told Tommy Dreamer, I said, man, I ain't never done this. My whole career, 20 years in the wrestling business, this is the first time I ever worked an opening match, dark match like this. He said, whatever you learn in professional wrestling, you need to forget it. This is ECW. <laughs> That's what, all right. <laughs> what do you think of the ECW product? I, I was kind of, I mean, what, the product itself, the actual, you know, the matches and all that, you know, the violent stuff was all right with me. I just... I was really surprised at how small the guys were. I mean, when I first when I see them on TV, I can't judge sizes like anybody. People see me and they go, man, I didn't realize you was that big. You know, and the same with that. I, when I went actual to the show, I'm like, man, these are some small dudes. You know, I didn't realize they were that small. You know, like Sabu and Van Dam and all them guys. I didn't, I mean, to me, size-wise, I'm saying they're small. But, I mean, I guess they're probably, you know, average or above. But. When you're six nine, they're small to you. You know what I'm saying? Because I was used my whole career was always big guys. Yeah. You know, WWF big guys. What, what do you think of Paul Heyman? I thought he was a you know I don't want to say genius, but I mean he was he knew what he you know he knew what had to be done and you know he he uh, had some great ideas. I'm just too bad I wasn't a part of them. You know, yeah. I was just there basically for, to get his guys over, I guess. And I mean he was always there with the money up until you know the last couple of times, you know, and, 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 you know, bleeding juice-wise, I didn't have no real big problem with that, it don't bother me, because I've done it my whole life, and, you know, I worked with Sal, uh, well, I started a little program with Van Dam. and Van Dam practically broke my leg one night, and, uh, I was in some town in Massachusetts, or somewhere up there, and we always do that some little spot where he throw the chair and I'll throw it back, he ducks and gives me that spin spin and heel kick. But for whatever reason he misjudged his distance and this time he I mean he knocked me out with it. I mean knocked me out literally. I've never been knocked out like that. You know, I've been close but I mean he knocked me out cold. And when I went down all my weight went to my my right side, you know, because I had no control over it. It just uh, my ankle was basically broke. It broke my ankle, my knee was all messed totally ripped out, you know, and then the bad thing was, you know, I mean, I know you get injured in the business, but at least come and apologize to the guy, you know. All the boys checked on me except him. He didn't even come in like, hey, man, I'm sorry, or well, anything like that, you know, till later, like, this was like many, many months later, I think he was doing a baseball slide and ripped his knee out, and then he calls me on the phone and he goes, man, uh, you know, I just I, I just broke my knee or whatever. I'm I'm sorry about hurting you, you know, and all that. But this was like almost a year later. At that time, he didn't come to the dressing room and go, "Man, I'm sorry, brother. You all right?" Yeah. I mean, just golly, he just broke my ankle, knocked me out cold. Honestly, he didn't know where I was. Then he's one. Then the referee tells me. The referee says my all he could see was the whites of my eyes, and and Van Dam's you know tr telling the referee, "Get him up so I can do my Van Daminator." That's all he's worried about. I'm knocked out cold, could be dead, and he's worried about doing his Van Daminator or whatever it's called. You know, I, I really, I didn't like that. Yeah, he did a, a bunch of matches with Van Dam. How, how otherwise should he go along with him? Up until that time, it was fine. After that, I told Paul Lee I'm not working with him anymore. Yeah. You know, because I don't trust him. If I don't trust the man, I want to, I'm not going out there every night and take a chance on being crippled. You know, especially when I was, I'm already in my 40s, you know, after 20 something years of be taking beatings. You know, I want to go out there every night, and then the thing with Van Dam, I mean, he has to, uh, I mean, I'm talking about from the opening bell to the end, he wants everything set up. I mean, I'll, I'll do this, cannonball roll, then you do that and do that. I can't do that. I, I, I don't I don't like working that way. I don't want to memorize stuff. I just want to go out there, play it free, let's have a good time, you know. But 
and he totally was opposite of that way. I mean, it had to be set up just perfect, and then you worry about, you know, is he going to kick me and knock my teeth out, or, you know, is, uh, is he going to give me that chair kick slide thing in the corner and kill me or whatever. I don't want to be that way. So I ended up working with Sabu some, yeah. you know, and Sabu was great. You know, he was he was easy to work with because he didn't really want to set nothing up. The hardest thing for me was that he does that chair spot where he puts the chair behind his legs, you know, drops it on the top back of your head. He knocked you know, my whole bottom teeth like were loose. Yeah. And I had to go to the dentist. They were like, honestly, I thought he was going to fall out from that chair thing, you know, because I was on the mat and I kind of raised up, you know, and he came down with that chair on the back of my head and my head's... He had a chair under me and one, you know, he does it that way. And, yeah. and my mouth went into that chair, boom, like that, you know. And, but, but at least with Sabu, you know, he, after the match, no matter what he did to you, he'd come and, you know, hey, you all right, blah, blah. He'd check on you, you know. Yeah. I respected that much of the man, you know. Plus, he showed respect to me. And I mean, and, you know, I'm a veteran of sport. And, and he took care of me in Japan. I had this, we had this three way dance thing in Japan. In FMW. Yeah. FMW, I took. I think Bam Bam Bigelow was scheduled to go, and uh, he he ended up signing a contract with WCW and went to WCW, if I'm not mistaken. And because uh, Bigelow, I remember, was at one of the TV tapings, and he asked me about that. He said, "Man, they, you know, they called me and offered me this contract. And what do you think I ought to do? Or stay here, or go down there?" I said, "Man, you crazy? You better go down there. You're gonna get killed here. <laughs> you know, this is, what are you making here compared to what they're offering you? You know?" And he's like, "Yeah, yeah I think you're right." So like, I guess next week he was gone. So that spot opened up for that FMW show, and and the week before that's when my uh, Van Dam broke my ankle and all that. It was all messed up. I was in a walking cast, you know, and I told him I'll go ahead and go, you know. And I took, I had a walking cast. I wore it over there, and I took a. Usually I wear pull-on boots. I took lace-up boots. I put it on, you know, taped it up as tight as I could possibly tape it. The doctor told me not to do it, you know. He said you're crazy, but I went on over there, worked that one match, you know. Which was it was pretty easy. Uh, like I say, Sabu took care of me. You know, uh, it was pretty easy. Did you think you were going to get pushed more in ECW? No, not really, because I because uh, I wasn't at the uh, ECW stable. I don't know if people understand when you say that, but you just wasn't in that click. Yeah. You got that certain click of ECW guys, you know, and you knew that's what they, you know, they were the ones that's going to get all the big push. And everything gonna happen with them guys. I knew I was probably just gonna be there to put guys over, you know. Didn't Which was mind. as long as he paid me, I was happy with it. I didn't care. But then when the when he couldn't come up with any more money, you know, it's a different situation. I'm at uh, you know, I I live in Baton Rouge. I fly out of New Orleans, you know. I'm, I'm I go to New Orleans. My wife drops me off in New Orleans. They always had a prepaid ticket there. So I get to the counter. There's no ticket there. They think I'm gonna pay my own ticket to go to the you know up here to Philadelphia to do the show. Yeah. So I'm like, man, these people are crazy because they'll we buy you a ticket and we'll, we'll pay you back. No, this ain't going to work this way. You know, the deal was you, you know, everything, you buy my ticket and all that. So I just I ended up sitting at the airport all day because I couldn't get in touch with my wife and all that. But anyway, that was my one of my last times with them. And that's that's pretty much the reason why you stopped doing ECW? Yeah, the money. Basically, it was money. They yeah. was having, I don't know, if, you know, they was having financial problems or whatever, but it was just a money situation with me. What was the uh, ECW locker room like? Uh, the locker room was probably one of the easiest going locker rooms I've ever been in. It was just uh, all the guys were super great, you know. They were all just basically almost like big marks almost, you know. Like, man, I, I'm there watching you do this or that or whatever. And they were just really, really nice guys. I mean, you know, for they were just super nice guys. Yeah. You also uh, worked uh, Bubba and Devon Dudley at the ECW arena. How are they to work? They were, they were, they're the uh, for them they didn't want they didn't want to do the uh, the three D drop three yeah. D drop and I said come on man you got I got to take that man one time I got to do it nah man you you know we don't want to do that to you 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 know you the one man gang blah 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 and I said no nah, it's all right it don't matter to me I want to do it so we set it up and ended up and I took the you know took their three D drop and all that about killed me but I took it yeah. about broke my neck. <laughs> 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 Other than that, I mean, working wise, they were great. Yeah, great to work with. Super nice guys. I mean, I mean, I bring my son to the matches, you know, and you ask for photographs, and no problems. You know what I'm saying? You know things like that. You know, I'm basically like a big, big mark myself. I go in the dress room with a camera. You know, hey, yeah. can I take pictures? Hey, come on, let's take some pictures. 
of stuff like that. <laughs> so. so ECW was a was a positive experience for you. Yeah, it was positive. It was it was real positive. Okay. Then uh, most uh, after that, you went back and you did the uh, gimmick battle royal for yeah. WWE at WrestleMania 17. What what was that like? That was uh, that was good. I mean, uh, I didn't. I was out of the country at the time. I was doing some uh, army base tours. We was out of the country doing some. Uh, military tours, basically USO type shows, the government sets them up and I was out of the country and I called home, my wife said, uh, you know, the WWE, you know, WWE called, WWF called, wanted you to do, you know, this gimmick battle royal thing, you know, and I said, what? I, I'm like, I didn't even believe her, you know, I'm like, you sure you got that right? Yeah, they got, I, I didn't even know they was having a gimmick battle royal because I was out of the country, you know, and uh, they, yeah, they want you to be in the gimmick battle royal, and I said, well, I'll be home in the next couple of days, you know. So I got home and they called me up, you know. Wooden Vince is one of his other guys. Uh, called me up and said, Yeah, we want you to do, you know, we got this gimmick battle royal. We got Michael Hayes, we got Sergeant Slaughter, and the Iron Sheik, and, you know, all the best gimmicks, and we want you to be in it, you know. And I said, Well, you know, I don't have the Akeem. I can't wear that Akeem outfit anymore because that was when I was 500 pounds and now I'm, you know, 350. They said, "Well, God, we ain't got time to make you know make you another one or anything, and oh, we'll be back in touch with you in a couple of days." So, a day or so later, oh, well, Vince said it's all right. You can come in as a one-man gang. You know, they wanted me as Akeem. Yeah. Because that's you know the, their gimmick. But he took me as a one-man gang, and I mean it was. I didn't know the guys. I mean, I knew the guys that came in for the battle royal. I know Sergeant Slaw, all them guys I know. But the new guys that were there, I don't know them from anybody. I never met them. I never met the Undertaker till then. Yeah. You know, all them guys. You know, but they were great. You know, I met all them guys. Super nice guys. You know, and, and even you know they're here big WWF wrestling stars, and they're like big marks. You know what I'm saying? They're like, man, I'm. You know, I watched you do this and do that, and uh, I'm like, well. Wow. Great man, I appreciate it. You know, it makes you feel good, really. Yeah. But uh, you know, the gimmick battle royal, I thought was great. I thought we had a, I mean, I thought it was something different anyway. You know, I thought maybe some of the wrestling fans, you know, maybe hadn't seen some of these guys, and it's like, you know, and putting Iron Sheik in there was like, you know, that was Iron Sheik all day was all happy when he found out he was going over. You know, <laughs> <laughs> yes, bad Iron Sheik, hey, <laughs> he loved it. <laughs> Did you think that it was going to lead to a job or anything? No, I didn't even go there thinking about that. I just went there just as, just to be in the battle roll and, you know, if anything happened after that, so be it, you know. But I didn't, I didn't honestly think, you know, I, I wouldn't go in there looking for a job, you know. Honestly, I didn't think it was going to happen. Me and even if, you know, I don't, I couldn't keep up the pace that them young guys keep up. There's no way, you know, I couldn't do that. Yeah. The way them guys work up there, you know, for TVs and stuff, I can't keep that pace. Well, what are you up to these days? These days, uh, pretty much uh, just independent still. I still work independent shows, and uh, but now it's more, you know, you, you go out, you're almost like a baby face every night you go out to a show because they're, they're more like, you know, uh, you know, you're like a icon or legend or whatever the word is, which, by the way, you know, I am in the Legends wrestling game. Yeah. <laughs> I played that. I beat everybody. That's the first time I ever pinned anybody. <laughs> but uh, yeah, now it's great. People just want to shake your hands, whereas before they want to cut you with a straight razor. You know, probably the same person. You know, years ago wanted to cut me or slash my tires. Now they want, hey, it's great to meet you. Shake your hand, and uh, basically just uh, hang around the house. Uh, that's about it. You know, hang around the family and and uh, try to get a book in every once in a while just to keep my skills sharp. You know, so you don't get rusty. I still love going to the ring. I couldn't do it full time. My body won't let me. You know, I know that. You know, so I just move on and do something else. And who knows what the future holds? I don't know. I, don't, I mean, I hope. You know, I hope over the years I, I did the best I could do every night. Uh, probably out of 20 years, I think I missed maybe three matches from injuries. You know, so I mean, I, I did the best I could do every night. I hope the wrestling fans enjoyed what I did and. You know, I hope I entertained a bunch of them, and I, you know, I appreciate everybody that bought a ticket to watch the One Man Gang or Akeem Russell, or you know, I appreciate every one of them. You know. Okay. Anything else you want to add or say to the fans? Or? Uh, no, I, can, I think I just said it. You yeah. know, I appreciate the fans over the years' support. You know, they've been great, and I was blessed, honestly, to be able to do what I honestly wanted to do in life. Not many people can do that. Uh, for 20 plus years, 26 years, I've got to do. 
in my life what I wanted to do. I dreamed of doing that, and I actually, you know, actually made it to a status where you, you know, you're a wrestling star or whatever they want to call it. You know, I, I feel honored to be in that category. You know, with some insane guys, and you know, like I said, thanks to the wrestling fans, I guess if not for them, I would have never made it. Thank you very much for joining us on this edition of the Straight Shooting Series. All right, the one-man gig's out of the house!